All right, so what's the file name? The file name is Banjo. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm finally playing Banjo. <laughs> you did it. All right, uh, so we're right on a timer? All right, three, two, one, go. All right, so this category is Ocarina of Time 100% No Source Requirement. That might sound like a kind of weird name. A lot of people might not be familiar with this category. So uh, Ocarina of Time is unique where it has two different 100% categories, uh, regular 100% and 100% No Source Requirement in this run. Uh, the reason for these two different categories is this game has a lot of glitches that kind of blur the line between what really counts as 100%. <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of glitches where you can, like, just glitch an item into your inventory or uh, duplicate an item and get it over and over. And, you know, hypothetically, if you could do all those kinds of glitches and just, you know, get every item that way, would that really count as 100%? Um, so we actually made two different categories. So regular 100% has what's known as the source requirement rule that says you must get each item from their original location. Uh, that means stuff like if you want to get the hammer, you have to get it from Fire Temple. You have to get each individual gold Skulltula, stuff like that. In this category, no source requirement, uh, that rule does not apply. That means I can get any I, I can get items however I want. Uh, any glitch I want to do to get items, anything is fair game. And uh, so, what originally what was really cool about this category is that there are a lot of glitches that are really cool that can glitch items in, in your inventory, but. Uh, originally, you couldn't really do that for like everything. Um, that like there was actually a really good balance between getting some items from glitches and then some items normally or like normally in terms of OOT glitches. <laughs> um, the reason I'm speaking in past tense though is because very recently, just two months ago, a brand new glitch was found. Um, basically, the biggest glitch the game has ever had, and you actually can now glitch all the items you want and just get everything kind of instantly. Um, now, this glitch was actually, so for those who don't know the GDQ process, the submissions actually happened back in September, and the, the games were accepted in October. This glitch was found in November, so like after everything was all settled. And so if I were to do a uh, completely optimal run with this new glitch, it would actually be significantly faster, but also it would kind of skip a lot of um, a lot of cool glitches that made this category really cool. But it was also a really cool glitch itself. So for this run in particular, I am actually going to be uh, using the new glitch a little bit, but not to its full extent. That way I can still do a lot of the, the really cool stuff that was in the run before and kind of mix it up with this also new glitch. Uh, just so, you know, the new glitch doesn't kind of take over the entire run. Um, we'll get to explaining that when it comes up. It'll be a little over an hour in. Um, but yeah, so onto the run. So one interesting thing to note about this category is that I'm running on the GameCube version. So a lot of Ocarina of Time speedruns, most are actually done on either the Wii Virtual Console version or the N64 version. They usually have like, uh, there's a few version exclusive glitches on N64. Uh, VC has uh, less lag and faster loading. Uh, also has a few of its own exclusive glitches. The GameCube version is very rarely used, um, mainly because it's pretty similar to VC except it just has really slow reset times. And uh, a lot of the time, that just means GameCube is kind of just the worst version. Uh, in this category, though, there actually is one particular thing that the GameCube version is very good at, and that's loading a lot of stuff. So uh, there will be some points in this run where I'm trying to load a lot of stuff, a lot more than I'm normally supposed to. And the GameCube version is actually the best at that. And so that's the reason I'm playing on the GameCube version, which is an unusual version. There are also some little things here and there I'll note throughout the run. Uh, so for general movement uh, throughout the run, you'll see me doing backwalking a lot. Uh, backwalking is very fast, generally the fastest form of movement for longer distances. Slide hopping is also pretty good. Um, uh, actually a bit faster, but hard to do perfectly. So it's usually used for like turning right after a backwalk. Rolls are also used for like shorter distances. And so, uh, beginning of this run, just kind of collecting the sword, getting some rupees, and gotta go buy the Deku Shield. And uh, I guess before the rest of us start lecturing you about everything that's about to blow your mind, uh, we should introduce ourselves on the couch. Oh, yeah. 
I'm glitched and stuff. Uh, I find glitches in this game, um, including many of the glitches you're going to see in this run. And, and the, the big one that was found. All, all his fault. True. Yeah. Sorry. And I'm Fish. blame him. <laughs> and, yeah, and I'm, I'm Danny fake. B. Oh. I run a lot of categories in this game. <laughs> and I'm Faked. I run uh, I run the game too and do a lot of research with the game. Alright, so normally after you buy the shield, you usually go straight to the Deku Tree. I'm gonna not do that. I'm gonna jump slash off that thing and do this really fast slide backwards. And I want to use the speed I just got to clip into this guy who's blocking the exit. And using all that speed, I can talk to him while sliding. I can clip into him and escape the forest. So I want to talk about that, that slide thing I did. So that's called an ESS, or Extended Super Slide. It's done by holding very slightly outside the dead zone of the control stick. And normally, if you're just doing that on flat ground, uh, Link will just kind of shuffle his feet in place and turn and won't really move. But it has an interesting property where it preserves your speed. So when I jump slash off that, off that little platform and go in the water, the water preserves my speed. And then when I go on land, if I hold that direction, then I can keep that speed. Uh, the catch is I have to keep holding it. So I'm, uh, the whole time, I'm just barely holding the control stick. Basically, the smallest input I can do without um, it registering is just no input. And that's actually going to be a very common movement technique throughout the run. And so uh, the reason I'm skipping, the reason I'm exiting the forest so early, even though this is 100%, uh, you think I need to, you know, go be Decatry and get all this stuff from there. Um, I, I will actually be going back to Decatry a while. In fact, we'll, we're, we're going to see a lot of Decatry. Um, <laughs> yeah, favorite dungeon in the game. Yeah, this run. It's, it's pretty nice. It's got some nice scenery. We'll check it out. Um, but yeah, I will be going back to Decatry later. A lot of this, this run is done very out of order. Um, the, if you think you know the casual way around this game, it's not relevant to a speedrun at all. At this point, I think anything can be done in any order. Basically. Yeah, pretty much. We can do whatever we want. So you say that uh, this isn't going to be like a casual playthrough, but the first thing I'm going to do is actually go straight to Kakariko, um, which is sort of what you're doing casually. But um, <laughs> anyway, um, as the issue was saying, the movement that you're going to see across Hyrule Field is very different to what you might expect if you've never seen an OT run before. Um, so just keep that on your mind that for the rest of this run, the movement is not going to be anything like what you expect, but everything we do is to try and optimize it as fast, as much as possible. Yeah, so over here I'm just uh, back walking to Kakariko, just the fastest way to get there. Um, I, I can't see where I'm going, but I can like, line it up beforehand. And you played the game before. So yeah, and I played, the, I played the game a few times. And uh, that same uh, glitch ESS I did earlier, I can do right here. Oh, cool. Uh, this is also what's known as a water ESS. There's a bunch of different types of it. That one in particular is a water ESS because it uses water. Um, and yeah, so it's a really fast uh, slide. And also another property of it is that Link cannot interact with NPCs during it. So there's actually an owl on the way to Kakariko that you'd normally talk to. But uh, using that, I, I just skip the owl completely. Wes's can actually change speed depending on how fast you were going when you exited the water. And just so happens that recoiling with your sword, like you did off that fence, is pretty fast. So here in Kagariko, I am collecting a bunch of Kukos. So uh, collecting all these Kukos uh, scattered around Kagariko rewards you with a bottle. Uh, casually, it's normally just used for, you know, fairies and potions and stuff. In a speed run, a bottle is probably one of the most important items. It is super, super glitchy and allows us to do lots and lots of really cool things. Yeah, so the start of this run is going to be not so much getting 100% like of all the items. It's going to be getting the tools that are really useful for making the rest of the run really good. And so bottle is a really, really big one. Yeah. Really er important. Early point of this run is mostly setup. And then the... That didn't go in. <laughs> and then the collection is more a little bit after we start doing... After the setup stuff. What a weird angle. And yeah, so grabbing these peppers can be a little tedious because their movement when they're on the ground is random, how long they wait and which direction they're going to go. Um, and another uh, important piece of information about this is that when you throw the cuckoos, they'll hop for a little bit, and then they'll start running in a straight line directly from where you're standing. So whenever ZFG is throwing a cuckoo, he's keeping in mind when the cuckoo starts running and will have it go in, in the direction that he wants it to go. 
I love thing he did there was sword slash, which makes them run straight away, which is really useful. All right, so after collecting all the, <laughs> all right, so after collecting all the cocos, I get the bottle. And now next place I'm actually going to go is Bottom of the Well. This is a place you normally don't go to until much later in the game. But I can actually get there with the help of Navi. So I'm going to jump slash and talk to Navi and fall through the water. Go straight in. So normally when you uh, do a jump slash, Link takes a little step back at the end of the jump slash. And if you talk to Navi during that, Link will kind of fall off the ledge, but then he won't interact with water while talking to Navi. So you just fall all the way to the bottom and get here much, er much earlier than you're normally supposed to. So uh, the reason we're here uh, is to get the bomb shoes. And you might be wondering how, because if you remember, there's a chest containing 10 bomb shoes in this dungeon, but it's below some ground that you need bombs to even get to. And see if he clearly doesn't have bombs here right now. So we're going to have to be a little bit more creative if we want to get these bomb shoes. And so the way to do that is this. Uh, what we call an ocarina dive, which is where you pull ocarina but manage to fall just off a ledge while you're doing it. And there we go. <laughs> Straight through the floor. Um, it may have looked like he was clipping through the ground there, but there is actually just normally a hole there covered by some invisible ground. Or uh, opposite invisible ground, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Intangible. Yeah. Oh no. Oh no. I'm stuck. Come on. I gotta like wiggle here to clip. Okay. There. So right now he's below everything, and he just swims straight into the room that has the bomb shoes without needing explosives. And that water is there because that water is there because if he kept the upper area loaded, he didn't load the basement, and that's a property of the ocarina. He fell through a loading trigger, but while in the ocarina state, you don't actually load room. And uh, there was another quick vine clip there to get back into the water so that we can quickly get to the dead hand room. Since this is 100%, we need Lens of Truth, and there's also, um, quite helpfully, some rupees at the back of this room. Oh yeah, sometimes the, the music gets really quiet during this fight. Uh, it happened to happen right now. You might not be able to hear it, but uh, if you turn it up loud, it actually you actually can just barely hear it. Yeah, it's very yeah I promise it's not a screamer. <laughs> Easy. Um, normally you have to wait for Dead Hand to go into the ground and come up again, but you can do a one cycle there by jump slashing at the right time. Yeah, he's uh, he's invulnerable until right before he digs, and then if you just attack right at the right time. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> if you attack right before he digs, uh, you can hit him again. It's so a reason the Lens of Truth. Uh, not a super important item, but just kind of required, and it's just right next to Bomb Shoes, which were the real important reason. No. Uh, the real important reason we came here. So here, I'm actually going to die. So I want to leave Bomb the Well, and this just happens to be the quickest way to do it. So this is actually one of the downsides of the GameCube version. A lot of other versions would actually just save and reset here to get to Bomb the Well, to get out of Bomb the Well quickly. Um, but GameCube, again, I'm, as I mentioned earlier, has very slow save and resets. So it's actually faster to die and just respawn at the beginning. And so the, the water in the well is it still does still all extend all the way down there, so I can swim back up. And uh, now here's going to be the first use of a HES. So that uh, the ESS I mentioned earlier with the water, I can also do that with a bomb. And this is the fastest, uh, fastest general movement speed in the game. And I'm going to be using that. Uh, that that's going to be a very common movement technique throughout the run. I'm going to be really blowing, blowing myself up a lot. Really powerful, it goes uh, over double the speed of normally, just like, well, it goes much faster than running, and it even goes much faster than backwalking, which is the next fastest. Yeah, I believe it's uh, exactly twice as fast as backwalking. As adult, yeah. You might have noticed he didn't talk to the owl that time either, but he wasn't doing an ESS trick. Uh, owls are actually really weak characters. You can skip them a thousand different ways. Uh, he stood next to a sign in that case, and when your A button says read, an owl can't talk to you. <laughs> So those rupees I got early in Bomb the Well, just got to buy a shield with this. And uh, if it wasn't obvious, the two things we really wanted were Bomb Shoes and Bottle. Um, yeah. Those are really... Those are ones. the most important items to get early in the run. Ba Even almost any Ocarina of Time speedrun gets those two as quickly as possible. And it's kind of handy that you can get them both from Kakariko. Yeah. Right next to each other. All right, so here I'm in Temple of Time. Normally, you need some spiritual stones and Song of Time to do anything in here. But I think I can get past the door. Just try it. I mean, it might work. 
Maybe you'll find a way. Nice. Oh, easy. No. <laughs> so, uh, that door is slightly misaligned, and there's just a little gap between the door and the wall right there. So I can do a backward slide hop to clip out of bounds, and then jump slash to clip back in bounds, skipping the door and bypassing basically the rest of the regular child section and becoming adult much earlier than usual. And in general, it's good to become adult quite quickly because adult can just use a lot of extra stuff. Adults just generally, yeah. the better, you know, if you want to get lots of stuff, you should t be turning adult, really. Yeah, adult, adult has faster movement speed, he can climb higher ledges, adult gets the warp songs. Hookshot. Uh, Hookshot, yeah. yeah. Adult can generally complete child dungeons pretty fast, but obviously yeah. child can't complete adult dungeons. Yeah, Ge general rule of thumb is if you can do something as both child and adult, it's faster as adult. <laughs> should, I, should I move my mic while, while, while hydrating? <laughs> you want any donations while we're waiting? Uh, yeah, this is a good time. Okay, great. Well, I would love to shout out this $1,000 donation. This is from Ta underscore, who says, I was going to donate for the OOT file name, but I missed the cutoff. Instead, here's a grand so we can see a grand glitch ex exhibition. Um, and just as a reminder, we are currently about 16,000 away from that glitch exhibition. So we are getting close, everyone. So let's get those donations in for that. Yeah, de definitely meet that glitch exhibition. It's definitely going to be worth it. I promise. Mm -hmm. Best one yet. Yeah. Want one more? Sure. <laughs> okay, this is uh, $100 from Brandor143, who says, great event for a great cause. Thanks for hosting Foo, and good luck on the run, ZFG. Thank you. Did we mention about Japanese yet? Oh, yeah. So uh, I'm playing the game on the Japanese version because the text is faster. Um, so in some games, there are like uh, version exclusive glitches that happen beyond one version or another. Uh, the English and Japanese versions of this game are actually completely identical. They have the entire uh, text of both games. It's just one little thing that says which version to use is the only difference between the English and Japanese versions. Yeah, it's like this little switch. Yeah. It's like, is it English or is it Japanese? And yeah. in the Japanese cut, it's, on, it's Japanese. And like, it's, it's literally the same game. Yeah. And interestingly enough, that's actually not the case with Majora's Mask, where that game actually has a huge amount of differences between the English and Japanese versions, where the text actually isn't that big of a deal in that game. Sometimes there's some glitches that involve text boxes, and depending on the size of the text box, one language or another will work differently. So there are kind of some glitch differences between the two languages, but not because of how they work. Yeah, that's a, a very rare circumstance, but there, there are a few cases like that. Although, as far as I'm aware, I don't think that actually affects too many speedruns. No, not that I can think of. Again, unless that's it with timer. Oh, yeah. Mm, yeah. No, you just got to mash B fast. <laughs> All right, long cutscene out the way. Um, and don't worry, because this run skips most of the long cutscenes. Yeah, it's actually, this game is kind of notorious for a lot of long cutscenes. Uh, in this category, not so much. There's actually quite a few cutscenes skipped. It's um, much, much heavier on gameplay compared to cutscenes. Except for this one. <laughs> we still haven't beaten this one. Yeah, <laughs> someday. I mean, we kind of can. Save that for later, though. Yeah. Mm. You want some more donations in the meantime? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. We have a $25 donation from Alpha Noel, who says, just wanted to donate in order to honor my mom, who has been battling a rare and resilient form of cancer. I'm overjoyed to see so much support for AGDQ and the Prevent Cancer Foundation. It makes my heart smile. Less than three. Let's meet that Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time glitch exhibition by the amazing ZFG. I agree. <laughs> so at the end of this cutscene, I have to save and reset. So the door time that I skipped earlier is actually still there as a doll. You might not have actually seen it, but that's because the door didn't load yet. If I approached it, the door would load and block me off. So the only way to get out is actually saving and resetting, which puts me back at the front of Temple of Time. 
So whenever you save in the overworld as adult, it'll always put you back in Temple of Time. If you save in a dungeon, then you'll just be at the beginning of a dungeon. And uh, for child, if you save and reset in the overworld, then uh, you'll be at Link's house. Although adult can actually spawn at Link's house as well. Yeah, the, the rare case, if you save in Link's house as adult, then adult Link can <laughs> respawn in Link's house. Super convenient that you end up on the other side of the door of time with just yeah. the save warp. If that wasn't the case, then the speedruns would look pretty different. Yeah, we'd have to get other items as child early, which would be kind of weird. Some old speedruns actually did that. All right, so uh, first thing as adult is going back to Kakariko. Kakariko just happens to have quite a few good items as both adult and child. So I can do some more Hesses to get over there quickly. Yeah, it's lucky these, most of these tricks you'll see work like exactly the same as Child Link and Adult Link. So uh, Bomb Chews normally have a pretty long timer uh, where you have to wait, it's uh, like six or seven seconds before they actually blow up. But if you hit them, if you hit them on uh, something like a sign or an NPC or something like that, they explode instantly. And I can use that to save a lot of time. Like right there, I just use the sign to blow up the bomb too early and start the Hess a lot earlier than they other otherwise would. So I can use that a lot to just blow bomb shoes up on uh, stuff around me. So I just talked to the cuckoo lady and got an egg. So that egg is the beginning of the Bigorn Sword trading quest. So normally it's it's this you know big trading quest you have to get one item trade it to an NPC uh, repeat over and over until you eventually get to the Bigorn Sword and I, I do need to do quite a bit of the quest but actually most of it is not going to be specifically for the Bigorn Sword uh, the items in the Bigorn Sword trade quest actually have some very interesting properties that we'll be going over soon uh, there are actually some very important items. <laughs> All right, guess the time, Ariel. 46. 47. I mean, uh, well, 48. It's kind of cheating now, yeah. <laughs> Hook shot's just one of those items that's so useful. It's good to have it early. So, um, a common question is why don't you have through this uh, whole race? But um, Dampe has a weird uh, effect where if you go, if you're really far behind him or really far in front of him, uh, he'll actually slow down and wait for you. So it is not faster to test through this, so we just roll. Yeah, you generally want to be pretty close to him, as close to him as possible, and generally just rolling is going to be uh, your best bet. Just you won, gross. <laughs> <laughs> no one guessed that. I got two flames, though. So yeah, you race Dampe uh, first time, he gives you the hook shot. You can also do a second race where he can get you a heart piece. I do need to obviously collect uh, 20 hearts during this run, but uh, because I can get those hearts wherever I want because of no source compartment, uh, I'm going to opt to not get uh, the heart piece from Dampe. It's actually a bit slow and I have some faster ways to get heart pieces. Uh, so I just blew up two bomb chews right before I opened this chest. They're going to hit me right after this. And I am going to take advantage of that and try to die again. And so, you see there I'm pulling out the ocarina every time I get hit. So normally uh, when a bomb explodes, the hitbox lasts for quite a while, but normally Link has invincibility frames that will prevent him from uh, taking damage repeatedly from the same bomb. But if you pull out the ocarina, it'll actually waste those invincibility frames. So you can get hit, pull out the ocarina to waste invincibility frames, or do something like talk to an NPC or read a sign or anything like that. Uh, do that, and you won't be invincible anymore. You cancel it, take another hit, uh, cancel it, repeat over and over, and so you can take up to nine hits of damage from a single bomb explosion, which happens to be very good when you want to die a lot. And uh, we're heading up here to Ganon's Castle area, not because we're doing Ganon's Castle now, but because this cutscene that you're watching right now actually sets the time of day to a specific time, um, night time specifically, which makes the sections coming up just Okay. Yeah, so uh, that egg I got earlier in Kakariko, uh, that egg needs to hatch. And obviously it's just going to be faster to hatch it if I make it night instantly instead of having to wait through day and then night and then day again. CFG, you've been pretty reckless with your bomb chew count, man. You only have one left. Oh no, I got to get more. This run uses so many bomb chews. How am I going to get more? You should have thought of this before the run. Yeah, bad routing. Danny, do you, do you know a way I might be able to get more? 
Yeah, you know, I think I might. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so ZFG is about to do a trick called RBA, or Reverse Bottle Adventure, uh, which is a very weird name for a very useful trick. And uh, so what we're going to do here is we're going to do some tricks with bottles. ZFG is going to dump out his bugs. And when he catches those bugs again, the game's going to know what button to put those bugs on based on what button he pressed to catch them, or more specifically, the last button he pressed, um, which is normally the button for the bottle. But ZFG just did a trick to have the last button he pressed be the B button instead. So now his bugs are on the B button. And that's super powerful, because when bugs are on B, uh, the game's going to write those bugs into your inventory, uh, not where the bottle is in your inventory, but somewhere else. Uh, and that somewhere else is going to be determined by what item he has on C right, which is a Poe. And uh, his bomb shoe count is not 1 anymore, if you guys were paying attention. It's 29 now. The value for bugs is the item 29. And so he wrote the value for bugs directly to his bomb shoe count. So bomb shoes for free. Yeah, so I actually did it with uh, quite a few items there. So the first item I actually did it with was Empty Bottle, and that actually puts a bottle in my third bottle slot. If uh, you saw on my pause screen there, I actually had another bottle in bottle slot three. That was from the first RBA. Uh, then it was Poe, which gave me 29 bomb shoes. Then it was uh, Lens of Truth, which put a bottle over where the inventory slot where the hammer would be. And then I did it with the Egg, which gives me a glitched Deku Stick upgrade that actually holds 30 Deku Sticks which uh, 30 Deku Sticks is actually the normal maximum capacity, but the upgrade that I got isn't technically the real one. So I do still need to get the real one, but having those extra, having the extra Deku Stick capacity will actually be useful. And uh, I was waiting there just uh, to wait for the Cucker to hatch. Unfortunately, there is some time to kill. I just have to kind of wait around. Um, gonna do more Bottle Adventure here. Uh, when I sell those bugs on B, that actually activates Bottle Adventure itself. If you looked at my Rupee count, I just got an extra digit. Uh, when I sold Bugs on B with Cucko on C right, that actually gave me the Adult's Wallet and the Gold Scale. And uh, I also, I also sold, sold Bugs in my regular bottle. That was just for more Rupees. Uh, I'm going to need a lot of Rupees in this one, actually. And uh, if you were wondering, we mentioned earlier that there was a new glitch found to get like a bunch of items. This is not it. This, <laughs> yeah, is, this, this is like scratching the surface. This is actually one of the first big glitches found. This was like 2005. This is super old. So just you wait. Um, well, t found in 2005, understood in like 2007. It actually took a while to understand this fully. See if she's going to be hanging on to that Poe so that he can put it on C right for more RBA yeah, later. Yeah, that, that, that bottle, that, that Poe is basically going to stay in my bottle for the whole run. It'll just be my, my free bomb chew refill whenever I want. Uh, gonna use the rupees I got earlier for a fairy. Uh, gonna be using this for a trick coming up uh, pretty soon. Gonna head up to Death Mountain. When ZFG earlier was saying that uh, the items in the Begoran Sword trade quest are super powerful, uh, he meant in regards to Reverse Bottle Adventure, having the items in the trade quest on C right are pretty cool. They write you do the bottle value to different parts of the inventory, like uh, like your equipment, like your medallions, maybe spiritual stones. We're gonna see some cool stuff. Yeah, like uh, that the Coco giving me gold scale and the adult's wallet. That's just the beginning of it. Uh, Kajiro, Kajiro's gonna do some cool stuff with uh, bomb bag and quiver. Um, the later tra trade quest items are gonna some, give me some cool items too. So here in Dodongo's Cavern, uh, only one thing I actually really want to do here. I want to get the bombs. Problem are, problem is the bombs are all the way up at the top of Goron or uh, of Dodongo's Cavern. I want to get up there pretty quickly. I want to hookshot this ladder. At the same time, I die, and I'm going to jump all the way up to the top. And uh, there's that fairy. Yep, familiar. And I think that was our first instance of using pause buffer. Um, so ZFG was pausing and unpausing uh, with perfect timing so that you could advance one frame at a time. And you can also input during the unpause lag, and it will input your button on the first possible frame. So he was able to get the hook shot yeah. for that jump. And yeah, that, that jump is uh, just interrupting the hook shot at the same time it hooks, hooks something, just ends up giving Link a really big jump. That'll actually be used another time later in the run, which is pretty cool. It's, it's one of the coolest tricks. I think everyone loves that trick. 
but bombs are actually the only thing I need in Dodongo's Cavern. I'm gonna head out. Yeah, explosives are really useful. Um, bomb shoes are great because you can get them relatively early. You don't need to go into Dodongo's Cavern. But bombs are also really useful. Um, you can do slightly different stuff with them. But for the most part, they're both just very useful items for going really quickly. So here in Goron City, uh, there's this rolling Goron you have to blow up and you talk to him and he like cries about Darunia and then he eventually gives you Goron Tunic and opens the doors. Uh, I don't want to talk to him, he talks forever. <laughs> so instead I'm going to clip through a wall, I'm going to do a mega slide hop towards this wall. I'm going to roll into this bomb tree explosion, slide hop and I'll go backwards really fast, clip through the wall, fall down here. And so now I'm going to go to Death Mountain Crater. I'm going to hookshot through the statue, and I can hookshot the ground there and just go through. So uh, that may have looked very strange. Uh, ho hookshotting that may have looked very strange. For some reason, it just happens to be hookshotable. It just happens to be hookshotable collision. Uh, there's actually quite a few places in this game that just have like hookshotable collision for seemingly no reason, and it just happens to be fast in that case. And so here, uh, I just died right at the beginning of a cutscene. So that cutscene was learning the Bolero of Fire. Uh, that, um, the Bolero of Fire cutscene is pretty long. I don't want to watch the cutscene. So if I, you actually get the song at the very beginning of the cutscene. So by dying at the start, I get the song. The game over interrupts the cutscene and lets me out of it. And I still get the song and don't have to watch the cutscene. And the same concept is actually going to be coming up pretty soon again. Uh, I'm going to go get the Minuet of Forest right now, which with pretty much the same stuff. See, what happened to that bottle you had on the B button? Oh yeah, so my bottle is now a Ducky Stick. So if you die, if you die with a bottle on B, it just turns into a Ducky Stick. Usually, uh, there are some cases where it can turn into other things, but they're like very uh, specific cases. But usually, yeah, it'll turn into a Ducky Stick. You also might have noticed that when he was in Goron City, he did that Hess out of Darina's room, and he just like went through the door that was blocking. Uh, most collision in this game is just one-sided, or all collision, I think, in this game is one-sided, so the back of the door just didn't exist. Except like door time. <laughs> That's like the one thing that was double-sided. Um, so there he did what's called a ground jump, where you try to pick up a bomb, but then you shield so that to delay picking up animation, uh, and then the bomb hits your shield, and trying to do a backflip makes him do a little forward jump instead. Climb up ledges. So again, dying at the start of the cutscene, I get the song, I don't have to watch the cutscene, and I can go straight, straight out of here. It's pretty lucky, the game gives you the song, I think twice in most cutscenes, the game gives you the song. Yeah. First frame the cutscene starts, and then again later on when you actually might expect it to, when you learn the song. Yeah, interestingly enough, um, that it's like that for most cutscenes, but not all of them. There's like a few exceptions where you don't actually get the song at the beginning of the cutscene. And for that reason, you can't really skip a, a few cutscenes. It's kind of weird. Uh, so more bottle adventure. I just caught a fish on B this time with Kajiro on C right. Uh, this time, I just got the biggest bomb bag that holds 40 bombs and a quiver that holds 30 arrows, even though, was that a bomb drop in the grass? <laughs> kind of want to go back to get see. that. Um, don't and yeah, I, I got the quiver even though I do not have a bow, which actually is going to be important. And now trade. No, I can't. Whatever. Uh, that Hessing trick that you've been seeing him do a run is actually, may look easy, just you know, because he's doing it all over the place. It's actually pretty pretty tricky to to not only start the trick, but control it so well. Um, it takes a lot of practice. So I'm going to do some more RBA here. Dumping that fish with uh, odd mushroom on C right actually gives me a heart piece. Uh, something important to note about it is it does not give me plus one heart pieces. It sets my heart piece count to exactly one. Uh, that means you can go from zero to one, or you can also go from three to one, uh, which would, you know, delete heart pieces. So I can really only make use of it if I have zero heart pieces. Um, so yeah, I just got one heart piece from that. And then uh, catching the fish with hookshot on C right just puts a bottle with fish over the inventory slot that would have ice arrows. 
kind of convenient. It gives me an extra fish, an extra, extra bottle slot. An extra note on steering Hesses, just so you guys are thoroughly impressed with ZFG here. Uh, when he's changing direction, like from left to right, that's him moving the analog stick in a very small ring around the center and switching halves between them and always staying inside the ring. So here, I just grab that ledge while targeting, and if I never let go of target, I can delay the heart piece that this guy usually gives me. Usually you talk to him, he gives you a heart piece. I'm delaying it right now, and I'm going to go up here and uh, get the heart piece while he's off screen from very far away. Uh, by doing that, uh, the game does not actually not set the flag that says I have gotten that heart piece from that guy. Normally, it, it would set a flag to say, okay, you got the heart piece, don't give, it, don't give it again. That didn't get set, which means I can actually get it from him again. Yeah, he didn't get that memo. Yeah. And uh, doing some shopping, gotta get some... Groceries. Yeah, <laughs> groceries, yeah. Uh, red potion and some decky sticks. I'm going to do, be doing the same uh, heart piece thing, but this time in a different direction. I'm going to be going uh, over to this side of the house. I'm going to delay more with the bomb chew this time. And uh, you may have noticed that he only actually got three heart pieces there um, because of the uh, odd mushroom RBA you saw earlier, which gave him the one. Oh boy, two mushrooms. Yeah, how did I do that? Right. So that's called Equip Swap. Um, found relatively recently, 2017, I think. Uh, and it's a glitch that happens entirely within the menu, which is pretty crazy that it took so long to find. Uh, when you highlight something on the pause menu, you scroll to the next screen and scroll back. If you equip something else in the very first frame possible, you'll equip the thing you, were, you used to highlight, except sourced from the new slot that you just selected. Uh, and so he was able to equip a second mushroom sourced from a different inventory slot. So he gets to keep the mushroom while he also got the odd potion, which is the next item in the trade quest. And what's really cool about that is that means, since I can RBA heart pieces with it, it means I can keep the mushroom and still RBA some more heart pieces, even though I'm advancing in the trade quest. And then I also did another RBA there with odd potion. That one gives me all three spiritual stones that you get from beating the three child dungeons and the Song of Time. So it's pretty big. So, coming up here in the windmill, uh, ZFG is going to learn the Song of Storms. There's actually a little bit of a cutscene skip that we can do. Um, the way that the Song of Storms cutscene works is that there's a value that the game is checking to make sure that you are uh, starting the cutscene. It's related to the next stage. But, we're going to do a little setup here and stack three bombs on top of each other. Just going to allow us to push past the loading trigger for this room so we can stand by the Song of Time block while the windmill guy is still loaded. And this has a special property of letting us um, pull the ocarina out, set this value, and start the cutscene right away. Yeah, and now I can walk around with these notes around, and I can actually play the song in the air, and walk around with this, and just leave, and just skip the cutscene. <laughs> So now I'm going to talk to this guy for a third time, get my third heart piece. Uh, I'm not going to dupe it again, just going to get three from him. Uh, so it might be, might be kind of weird that I just happen to dupe him exactly three times. Uh, why don't I just do that? Uh, so, you know, I could just do that infinitely, uh, but there are actually other ways I can get heart pieces in this run that are just happen to be faster. Uh, the reason I do it twice is because I can combine it with other stuff like the Odd Mushroom RBA for a heart piece and going in the shops and stuff. Uh, I combine it with that stuff to minimize the time lost from doing it. So it's fast for, it's fast to do it twice, but uh, doing it anymore would just not be fast. So I just got a quiver. So normally you can't play this game unless you have a quiver, which normally means you have to get the bow from Forest Temple. I didn't do that, but I did get the, I did get the quiver when I did RBA with Kajiro on c right. I mentioned that gave me a 30 euro quiver. That lets me do that mini game and uh, that lets me get the quiver upgrade. So now I have the 40 arrow quiver. I'm just gonna climb in here quickly, get this heart piece. <laughs> nice little cow. <laughs> Can I do a quick shout out and donation? Yeah, sure. Because if anybody didn't notice yet, we just hit 700,000! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> 
That's amazing, everyone. Thank you so much for all of your support so far. It's fantastic. Real quick donation from $25 from the Lovely Boots, who says, how have we not hit the incentive for a Glitch Expo in Ocarina? Hey, listen, let's hit that 60K, everyone. And just so you know, we are less than 6,000 away. So we are getting so close, everyone. Just get whatever donations in you can, and we will see this glitch, glitch exhibition. Let's make it happen. So I'm heading back to Lost Woods again. Uh, Got to advance the trade quest again. Um, there's a that old guy from Lost Woods before is replaced by a little girl. I'm gonna give her some odd potion. All right, more RBA here. Uh, dumping these bugs one more time with that Mushroom on right to uh, get another Heart Beast. That'll be the last Heart Beast I get with that. Gonna catch these bugs with Poetra Saw on right. That one's a really big one. That actually gives me some songs. It gives me Zelda's Lullaby, Nocturne of Shadow, uh, Prelude of Light, and Serenade of Water, uh, which is pretty huge. Uh, specifically, Nocturne and Zelda's Lullaby. Those are both, uh, those both require like long cutscenes to watch and some specific requirements for Nocturne of Shadow. So having those songs early is super, super good. And uh, I finally equipped Sword back on B, so Bottle's gonna take a break for now. And I'm gonna head over to Zora's River. That gold scale come in handy here. Yep. Proof that I got the gold scale, even though you didn't see it earlier. So there's this waterfall blocking the way to Zora's Domain. You normally need Zelda's Zolbi, which I did just get, but it's kind of slow to play the song, so I'm just gonna go behind the waterfall. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> Second try. All right, so... First try, nice. Yeah. <laughs> So here in Zora's Domain, uh, I want to make my way to the top. I want to go see King Zora, gonna hess up there. So King Zora is currently frozen in red ice. Uh, thing. Um, so he's currently frozen in red ice. Uh, you know, all of Zora's Domain's frozen over. And we gotta unfreeze him. Normally I need some blue fire to unfreeze him, but I uh, don't have that right now. But I do have another thing that can unfreeze him, which is this poacher saw. I see. And if I leave and reload the room, he's unfrozen. So, uh, when when a text box comes on screen, uh, as as the camera is panning towards King Zora, it kind of just messes with the red ice loading, and then you leave and reload the area, and he's just unfrozen. Uh, it, since we didn't beat Jabu, he's still blocking the way, so I've got to do a quick clip out of bounds there. Yeah, you normally have to move him as child, but I never did that, so I got to clip out of bounds. You missed the best cutscene in the game, dude. We <laughs> dang. All right, so next I want to go to Jabu. A uh, little problem, he's normally not here as adult. Uh, there's kind of this big iceberg uh, in the same place where he normally is. Uh, it turns out he's kind of still there, or at least the loading zone is. He's hibernating. Yeah, so the, the uh, loading zone for Jabu is actually still under this ice here, so I just want to get under it. So I'm going to do a little hover here. I don't think we actually mentioned that earlier. So um, the... When he stabbed and talked to the sign earlier, he got a glitch called Infinite Sword Glitch. And uh, when you have this active, you're swinging your sword every frame. And uh, a property with that is that you can't fall off ledges. And you can use that to hover in the air like he is right now. And then the mega, mega flip. And now I'm in Javu. There we go. And uh, you might have been confused why why was there so much why was there so much pausing there? Um, that's because a lot of tricks in this game are very precise. Um, in fact, they're precise to the frame in many tricks, which means that this game runs at 20 FPS and you have to hit the right inputs on very specific frames to get some of these tricks to even work in the first place. They're very precise. 
And so it may seem like he wasted a bunch of time pausing there, but the fact is that it wouldn't even be possible if he didn't, you know, pause to buffer his inputs there to make sure they were all on the right frames. Yeah. It's so difficult. So what, what's really interesting about a lot of tricks in this game in general is, you know, like, like uh, GNS said, th this, this game has a lot of very precise tricks, not only timing-wise, but also like position and angle-wise. There are some tricks that are like precise to a, a ten thousandth of a unit, and that, that sounds like, you know, ridiculously precise, but uh, this game has amazing setups to make the most precise stuff kind of trivial. Uh, like, um, you'll see later when I do some more setups later on, you can kind of just uh, almost find any position you want just by like using combinations of backflips, side rolls, uh, targeting walls. You have so many tools in this game for very precise movements uh, with both pos position and angle, and then combine that with pause buffering's uh, ability to um, do timing so precisely. Uh, this game actually has extremely precise tricks that, again, just kind of become trivial, not trivial, but uh, they become a lot, a, a lot, <laughs> yeah, possible, possible a lot easier uh, because of the ability to like make these incredibly precise setups that um, just make it not so bad. And it mostly comes down to the fact that in like a corner, you know that Link's, if Link runs straight into a corner, he's always going to be in the same position, like the exact same position every time you run into that corner. So then if you do the exact like side hop chain or backflip or roll, you know he's just going to always be exactly one backflip away from that corner. And you can kind of just build it up from there to make sure that wherever you need to be in the room, as long as you get there from a chain of side hops, backflips, rolls, things like that, you're always going to be in the same position every time. And one more super important setup tool that we use, uh, some, we mentioned earlier, is ESS, which is uh, the thing that we use to like slide across the ground really fast. It also has one other property, is that uh, you can turn Link in place one frame at a time, and every single uh, frame of rotation is exactly the same amount of rotation. So we can use that to get really precise angles pretty easily. And uh, all this was to get to the boomerang room. Unfortunately, it's quite a long sequence in Jabu, but... Uh, boomerang will be really useful for the brand new trick that we were talking about at the start of the run. Yeah, and the reason you have to bring Rudo all the way up is just for that switch. Uh, that switch is very picky. It wants Rudo only. Uh, oh my God, I almost died. <laughs> I want I want low health, but not this low health. Yeah, a famous vibruto. <laughs> it is boomerang. She's so happy, look at her. <laughs> <laughs> she's so excited for the run, she's shaking. Yeah. So uh, getting the boomerang is all I need in Jabu. I mentioned earlier how I did reverse bottle adventure to get the three spiritual stones uh, with odd potion. And uh, again, that gives me Zora Sapphire, so don't need to be Jabu. So next I want to go into Shadow Temple. I, man, my health is a little bit scary. I should be fine. So earlier when we were in the windmill, Fig mentioned uh, a bomb push. So when you run into, when you run into certain kinds of like objects, uh, they have a little bit of pushback. And when you stack three bombs on top of each other, that pushback, pushback is additive. And so you get three times the pushback, which is just barely enough to squeeze all the way through the loading trigger for that room in one frame, so it never detects you. Yeah, there's a lot of um, rooms like that in this game that you might not have realized casually are actually two separate rooms, but there's like a loading kind of thing in the middle, which actually loads the next room. Uh, that's an example of one of them there. So by going past the loading trigger, you're able to just completely skip the giant door that's normally in the way of the uh, Shadow Temple. I should have saved you saved there because I wanted to pick up a heart, but I've, there's there's two pots there. There's one that has a heart and one that has Deku Nuts, and I really need to avoid the Deku Nuts, and I was pretty sure I remembered which one was which, but I did not want to pick up the Deku Nuts. It would have been uh, a bit disastrous. More music glitch. Oh, oh yeah. Twice in a row. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we can fill that with donations. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, great. We have a, let's go with the uh, $200 donation. This is from Anonymous, who says, yeah. 
<laughs> they say, uh, have watched GDQ for the past three years and happy to be in a place to donate once again. Two years ago, my mom was, uh, was diagnosed with colon cancer, but we're blessed that it's gone into remission. Congratulations. Here's to helping in the fight to stop cancer. Also, put this toward the Legend of Zelda OOT glitch exhibition. So what CFG is going to be doing here is going to look a little strange. Uh, the memers in his chat will be posting question marks in the chat. Um, so there is an actor in this room that controls the intensity of the rain that's in this area. And it has a property that every time you go through that loading trigger that we were talking about earlier, it will load another one. So every time he's loading the room and you see the top appear, he's loading another one of these uh, rain actors. And by loading the exact amount that we need, we will space them in memory such that the grave coming up that blocks the sun's, uh, sun song area is not going to be there at all, and he can just jump right in. And, uh, and I think we're talking about actors there, um, and that's going to be quite important for some of the stuff later as well. So if you're wondering, when we say actor, we mean anything maybe like a torch or Link himself or a chest or, you know, kind of things that are placed in the world, interactable things. But it's also some other stuff as well, like audio effects, enemies. Um, so when we say actors, we generally are referring to those things. And uh, there's, a, there's like a region in, in memory, like in RAM, where all these actors load. And some of these glitches you're going to see in the run have quite a lot to do with the fact that that memory space where these actors load is only so limited and, you know, it, 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 it's uh, at the end of the day, it's just memory. So uh, we can try and uh, we can try and abuse that. So yeah, getting fun song here, another song. Um, this uh, there, there's sort of other ways to get fun song, but um, it's really just pretty fast to get it normally, and uh, especially with that trick to unload the grave and stuff. Um, it's usually useful useful for skull toys. Um, it's, it's kind of useful for skull toys in this run, I guess. A little bit. Not a huge amount. You'll see why. Uh, but right now, I want to head off to Forest Temple. I'm going to go actually go beat my first dungeon. For real. Uh, in just a second. No uh, worries. Yeah, so in this first room in uh, Forest Temple, there's these four Poes that come out of the torches, and uh, they, like, move this elevator down, and the whole goal of Forest Temple is, you know, go around Forest Temple, get the bow, and shoot the paintings that they're in, and then kill all the Poes so you can finally get to the basement, which leads to the boss. Uh, I'm just going to go to the boss. I'm not going to bother with them. They're kind of slow. All I gotta do to get to the boss is head over to the other side of the room and not bonk. Uh, I want to get this one gold skull over here. Um, actually, yeah, I need I need to be collecting gold skulls in this run. I've only this is only my second one. I, I gotta really start to collect some more. Oops. Yeah. So I'm gonna uh, do a backflip over the railing there. That's gonna clip me out of bounds, and I'm gonna jump and uh, hit a loading zone. And this is the boss room. So whenever you're in a dungeon, all of the collision in the dungeon is always loaded. So that's uh, walls, floors, ceilings, and loading zones. So no matter where I am in Forest Temple, the boss loading zone is always somewhere. So if I can get out of bounds and I can just go to where the loading zone is, I will go to the boss. And so that's exactly what happened there. The, the boss loading zone is just below that area. Just flip out of bounds and jump towards it, and I'm at the boss. And. Uh, so this boss fight, I have to do a lot of waiting. I have to just kind of wait for him to enter and exit the paintings. And uh, I'm going to use this to do some stuff. First, I want to take some damage. And then um, after I hit him the first time, I'm going to use this opportunity to do some more reverse bottle damage. I don't have bugs. Uh, oh. OK, this, this should be fine. I just have to remember to get bugs later. Where's the best place? Um, probably graveyard. So I just caught fish on B with Poe on C right. That's another um, another Poe refill. That's gonna be 25 bomb cheese this time. Um, so yeah, the reason it's 25 instead of 29 like before 
is different item values. So uh, Fish's item value is 25, Bugs' item value 29. And that's why they're different. So generally, that usually means like uh, you want the higher item value. But sometimes there are cases where the lower item value is good, um, like I did earlier with Fijiro. Oh, come on. So I have ISG right now, which is why the ball is automatically uh, bouncing back. And really? Dude. He's gonna give me that attack, isn't he? I know it's coming. Oh no, oh, there it comes. Don't do this. Okay. 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 I was kind of scared there because usually ISG should always hit the ball back. You should never have any issues. There's like this really rare chance where ISG doesn't hit the ball and you just die. <laughs> and uh, that'd be bad. That kind of suck. Do you need to keep this fish that's on B? Uh, yes, I do. I'm going to get a fish by RBing Red Potion right now. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think if I should get bugs now or later. I should probably get them before school, so I do think. So I'm going to do RBA more right now. I'm going to drop this fish on B and catch it with a uh, red potion on C right. This puts a fish in my uh, second bottle slot, which actually gives me uh, yet another bottle. Um, so now I want to uh, beat the dungeon, but I don't want to watch this cutscene. So I'm going to do this setup to here. So I'm doing a glitch called Ocarina Items on the edge of the blue warp, and this will give me control uh, as the blue warp is going. Uh, the purpose of this bomb is I want to die in a very specific frame. This will... <laughs> yeah, um, kind of spinning because of the blue warp properties there. So this will give me the forest medallion, but I won't have to watch the cutscene, which you'll see with this flash here. This white flash. Safe to say. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, gotta get bugs, too. And so cool. uh, That's not the song I want to okay. play. I want to play Nocturne. Something that glossed, got glossed over a little bit there was uh, Ocarina Items, which is a glitch you can do also with bottles, where if you have a full bottle in your hand and you're in midair, you press the, the button for the bottle, and then you press the button for another item that Link can draw in his hand. And when you land on the ground, Link will play that item that you pre pre press second as an ocarina. Um, and you can't use ocarina in boss rooms normally, so it's pretty useful for doing wrong warps and cutscene skips. Uh, yeah, so I need bugs. I was supposed to have bugs earlier. Um, I think I hit in this bottle. So I just have to make a quick detour over here to grab some bugs. Uh, while I'm here, I might as well try to get a bomb drop, if I can. Would be nice. Oh, oh I actually we got go. one. Nice. So now, back on track, back to the forest, where I actually wanted to go in the first place. So the first thing I want to do is actually catch a fairy. And uh, I'm actually, I want to catch a fairy, and I also want to get rid of that red potion. So what I'm going to do is, uh, I'm going to play Song of Time for this. Normally, a lot of people think you just need to use Zelda's Lullaby to uh, get a fairy from a Gossip Stone. But any Grey Note song aside from... Uh, aside from Song of Storms, we'll do it. The reason I want to play Song of Time there is because it's two frames faster than Zelda's Lullaby. And uh, I also did a bottle dupe there to dupe it over the red potion, so I don't have to bother with the red potion anymore. Uh, be your skull. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, that's three gold Skulltulas. Yeah. Almost, almost to 100. <laughs> gonna get, gonna get 100 pretty soon, probably. There's one of those uh, setups we were talking about earlier, using side hops and things like that to get in the right position. Yeah, so here I want to hover out of bounds, and this is going to be the start of setting up for getting a lot of gold skulls. Uh, you guys want to take it from here? Yeah, so TFG mentioned earlier um, that the, one of the good things about GameCube is you can load a lot more stuff. Um, you're going to see that here. So in this game, here you're seeing these black loading planes, uh, which are similar to the ones that we skipped in, for example, going into Shadow Temple. Um, they load the room. Uh, however, if you go in from the back and the room's already loaded, then it will, it can, in this case, it can load another copy of the room. And you can just keep doing this to load multiple copies of the same room. And uh, so, uh, the, um, the Skulltulas in this room that spawns up on a higher ledge are just going to keep spawning over and over again. Every time he slashes, two more load. And uh, so many load, in fact, that the game's going to start struggling in a minute. And you'll see what I mean by that. Right now, that the screen is frozen, but the game is still running. So, uh, yeah, that is not a problem with the tech or anything. The game itself is freezing on that frame. Um, the gameplay is still happening, but the visuals are not. Right, ZFG has an exact setup, uh, so even though he can't see what's going on, he knows the movements needed to uh, send the shoe at his face. So, unfortunately, he can't just duplicate 100 Skulltulas, you have to do it in batches. Just because of the way the memory works, it would be too much otherwise. And uh, that was the last five. So if, if everything's right, there should be 92 Gold Skull Slot tokens and five Gold Skull Slots. And he just did a trick there to um, stay targeted while uh, facing the other way. And this is because if he was to look at the sculpture list, the screen would freeze. So Yeah, because there's so much stuff on this map, you've got to be careful to not look at any of it, because then it will start rendering. Oh, yeah, like that. Like that. <laughs> and bad things might start happening. Uh, it'll happen again here as I get close to the sculpture list. It's OK. There we go. All right. Hopefully we didn't miscount. <laughs> um, uh, so... 100 gold skull Perfect. Toys. So it's pretty lucky you can just run into all, like, 92 of them, and... Uh, you don't get 92 text boxes, otherwise we'd be sitting here yeah. for a while. Yeah, if you get two Skulltulas like, at the same time, then you only get one text box. I did get multiple text boxes there, but that's just because I had to kill those last five and they kind of died at different times. So I, uh, the reason I save and reset there is because, uh, as you might expect, after loading so much and having the screen frozen, the game was very unstable. And so I kind of wanted to fix that by saving and resetting. Uh, but conveniently, this takes me back to Temple of Time, which is where I want to go. I want to do a rare thing in speedrunning, which is open the door of time. Um, I had to leave and, leave and re-enter the Temple of Time. It seems really weir weird, but um, this cutscene will only actually open the door of time if you enter from the front entrance. So if I just uh, save and load here, it's not going to open if I play the cutscene. It, it's really weird, too, because the cutscene plays like normal, and you know it plays the music and everything. And it's like, you know, this big epic sound effect, and then nothing happens. Yeah, it's my favorite, favorite cutscene in the game, because yeah. nothing happens, and then yeah. the door opens. Can I make a quick announcement? Yeah. Sure. Looks like we'll have to start donating toward the madness that's going to be Animorphs, because we have fulfilled the incentive for the Glitch Exhibition. Nice. Yeah. 
And if I can say the word exhibition, right? <laughs> Can't wait to see that. Yeah, you'll not be disappointed. Yeah. Uh, so right there, um, I just entered the cutscene trigger for the prelude of light, and that cutscene skip was a little bit different. Instead of dying like a lot of other cutscenes, I played the, the Sun song uh, right before, uh, right as the cutscene started, and that let me reload the room and uh, skip the whole cutscene. Uh, so I got some more RBA here. I got to catch, uh, catch with Poe on C right again, get more bomb shoes yet again. Um, oh, I got to catch that back in my bottle. Uh, please. Oh, okay, man. whatever. I just have to dump my bugs again. That actually puts me down to 20 chews and then back to 29 for that. Catch these bugs in my real bottle. And then I also have to dump with the fairy on C right. Fairy actually modifies my Deku stick count, so this will actually give me 20 fairies. 20 Deku sticks. Or 20 Deku sticks. Why did I say 20 fairies? <laughs> um, and uh, before going back in time, a very important thing to note is I had a bottle on my B button as adult before going back in time. That will be very important for later on. I'm back to child again because a few reasons. Uh, for one, some stuff you just have to get as child. Uh, for another one, uh, the new glitch, the really big glitch that you'll be seeing somewhat soon or uh, in this run will be done as Child Link. And uh, also, I, since I just got my 100 gold Skull Spoilers, I want to go to the House of Skull Spoilers and collect my rewards, which uh, is right here after the graveyard. Before I leave the graveyard, um, I want to actually grab a heart piece here. So there's a very quick heart piece I can grab um, in this box up here. Normally you're supposed to use a magic bean to get up on this ledge and then break a box to find a heart piece. But you can throw the boomerang and have the boomerang curve around and pick up the heart piece on the return trip. I normally need enough farm bombs here, but since I got bombs earlier, don't have to do that, which is really nice. It's pretty cool that when the boomerang is on the return trip, it doesn't actually collide with anything to make sure it gets back to Link. Uh, that was useful there. It's also going to be very useful for the new big glitch later. So, uh, just a second ago, I just did a quip swap to... Are you serious? I'm right in front of him, dude. <laughs> uh, I did a quip swap to equip the poacher saw on, uh, on C as child. Now, normally, child cannot equip that item, but equip swap actually takes the uh, usability of whatever item slot you're equipping and not the item itself. So, there's no problem with equipping it as child with a quip swap. And interestingly enough, that guy I just traded it to, he's normally, you're sp normally supposed to trade to him uh, as adult in Gerudo Valley, but he's also in Kekariko as child, and it works perfectly fine as child, even though you're not supposed to. So here, collecting my rewards. Uh, that's a Stone of Agony. Here's some Bomb Chews. Here's the Giant's Wallet. And here's a very special one. So the 100 Gold Skull reward, commonly referred to as a very useless reward you get for getting all the Gold Skull is actually useful in a speedrun. And not just once, but actually twice. I am going to play Sun Song to make a knight and reload the room. And you can actually get 200 rupees from him every time you reload the room. So I just reload, talk to him again for more rupees. And there's one, I got, got to get one last reward. This guy, he's going to give me a heart piece. Intentionally avoiding the last guy who has a second wallet upgrade. Uh, if we were to get that one right now, we would actually downgrade our wallet uh, because the ZFG RBA'd one of the middle tier ones before. Yeah, so talking to him would be pretty bad. I, my run would be invalidated. Well, I could technically do a backup. Back. Yeah. yeah, we'll get to that very soon. So another save and reset to get back to Kachiri Forest. Gonna finally head to the Deku Tree. Finally go to the first dungeon. But uh, like the Deku Tree cutscene where you're talking to him, and he's like, "Oh, you gotta go and kill Goma." It's kind of boring. So don't really want to do that. Don't really want to listen to the Deku Tree. Yeah, I, I kind of don't want to watch that cutscene. So I'm gonna head out of bounds. I'm gonna get ISG off the sign and do some little trick jumps here to get on top of this house. And from here, I'm gonna start doing a hover. 
with some twisted backflips. And this lets me get to this out of bounds area. From here, I can jump down and get out of bounds right here. This skips a load trigger that loads this area of Kihiri Forest. This means the cutscene isn't there, and also the deck tree's mouth is not there. Uh, you'll see Link fall a second right here. Yeah, right there. That's where the mouth is supposed to be. Just not there. And it's like an enter deck tree. And uh, this is where the, the big one. Yeah. yeah. Safety save. Yep. This is where the big one happens. So yeah, the, the big new glitch I was talking about earlier, this is where it happens. We spend a while here. Yeah. Yep. So uh, there's going to be some some stuff that seems a bit random. Um, CP's going to go straight up to the compass room at the top of Deku Tree and then leave again and come back down again for seemingly no reason. Um, the new glitch has is all to do with the boomerang, essentially. Or at least the way you're going to see it is all to do with the boomerang. When the boomerang picks up something like a heart drop or a gold sculptor token, what's actually happening is in order to move that gold sculptor token or that heart drop or whatever back to Link, it has to change the position in mem uh, the position in the world of that drop every frame to be the same as the position of the boomerang. So it gives you the illusion that the boomerang is carrying that actor. So every frame, the boomerang like comes back to Link, and the thing it's carrying then snaps to the boomerang again. And the way it does that is just by changing some of the values um, that the game uses in memory to keep track of the position of the, in this case, it's going to be a heart drop. Um, so, you know, the boomerang, we can use the boomerang, and it, it writes position data to the heart drop. Like, that's just how the game works. Nothing weird about that yet. Um, but this, in this glitch, what we're going to do is we're going to have the boomerang connect with the thing. So have the boomerang connect with the heart drop to pick it up. And then we're going to make sure the heart drop unloads from memory and something else loads in its place. So when the boomerang starts trying to write position data to the heart drop, it's not actually going to be a heart anymore. And it's going to be writing position data to something else in memory, which is going to have pretty big consequences. Um, and so this glitch is all to do with shuffling around data in memory. So that's the reason he went up to that top room and back down again. It's because we wanted to unload the main room, load some of the stuff in the top room, shuffle the memory around a lot by loading and unloading things in different orders. And so he's doing exactly that here. He dropped a bomb chew, which loaded the bomb chew into memory. He's dropped a fish, which, loaded, which uh, loads the fish into memory. And all this is just to shuffle data values around. Um, so you're going to see a lot of that in this room. There's going to be dropping bugs, bomb chews, fish. Um, and uh, this whole section is to make sure that when this uh, De uh, Deku Scrub stops talking, he's going to spawn a heart. And you want that heart to spawn in a certain particular place in memory. So you fill up all the previous spots in memory with all these fish and bugs and bomb chews. And you do just the perfect combination of items to get in the perfect position. So now the location in memory of this heart drop is in a very specific place that we want it to be in. Um, and the way we're going to unload the heart drop is by leaving the room. You know, when you leave the room, everything inside it unloads. So we're going to boomerang the heart drop and then leave the room. Um, but of course, before we leave the room, we have to do some more memory shuffling because we want a very specific thing to load into the place where the heart used to be. And it needs to be in a very specific location in memory. And not only that, but when we do the trick, you have to be in a very specific position um, so that when you load the new room, the location of the boomerang, which actually connects with Link on that frame, so it's actually the location of Link, needs to be in a, such a precise position that we write the perfect data to the place we want to write it to. And so this is when Zichi was talking about how some tricks are precise to like the 10,000th, you know, it's really precise position. That's kind of what you're seeing here with them running against the wall and stabbing the wall and running again. It's not useless. It's very, very clever manipulation of the movement in order to get Link into the perfect position. So all the memory is set up now. He's just going to try and boomerang this heart. And on a very specific frame, he's going to leave the room. Um, if all goes well, which is why there's so much pause buffering in this setup. And uh, we'll talk about this more in a minute, but um, the whole setup here is very precise, very difficult. 
and required someone who knew what they were doing with setups to be able to do that. And that's where Danny stepped in and helped out here, because this wouldn't be possible without him. Um, all three of us had like a massive part to do with this. And CFG is incredibly brave to be doing it in a marathon run, <laughs> because it's just so difficult and so crazy. Um, he's pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah, and we had this setup fully done, what, only like two weeks ago? Yeah. Or something like that, so we learned it very quickly. So, again, we need the boomerang, or we need Link to be in a very specific location when we load the basement of the Deku tree. And so, all the movement here you're going to see is going to be to move Link exactly perfectly, exactly on the right frames, so that he gets in the exact right position just as the boomerang comes back to him. And just as we load the basement and Link catches the boomerang, ideally, the thing that we want to edit is going to load into memory in the position that the heart drop was previously in. So right now, um, there's a gap in memory where the heart drop was. We unloaded the heart, so that bit of memory is now free. When we load the basement, something's going to load into that free um, block in memory. Right, so not only is the um, location where you catch the boomerang important, it's also about the timing, because we need to catch the boomerang on exactly the first frame that the next frame is going to load. And I'm not going to go into reasons why it's a little complicated, but there's many different precise things. All right, and that is the, the end of phase one. And that, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> I just, I just want to say it might not have been obvious, but that is by far one of the hardest tricks in OT to perform live RTA. And he's just smashed it first try. And like, it's, it's so thoroughly impressive what just happened there in front of you. If any part of that failed, he would have to reset and do it all again. Um, so we've got another trick. So I guess you might be wondering, like, what is it? What do we edit? What do we <laughs> write the data to? Um, and uh, I'll talk about that in just a second. But first, what uh, CFG is doing is uh, being dying underwater, but he didn't actually quite surface before he went to those vines. So as far as the game is concerned, Link's underwater state is still like set, so the game the game still waiting for Link to surface, and one of the uh, I guess results of that, the fact that the Link's underwater state is still set, means that if he picks up an item, it's going to wait for Link to surface in water before it gives it to him. So he just picked up a Deku nut there, but because he was in an underwater state, the game was like, oh, just like don't give it to him yet. Wait till he surfaces, and he can hold it in the air. Uh, so. Yeah, as I was saying, what did, we, what did we edit? We edited the contents of that chest, the one that he just walked in front of and then left again. Uh, that now contains the item Zelda's letter. Um, and I'll let someone else explain why Zelda's letter is particularly important. Yeah, so there's a trick in this game called get item manipulation. Uh, if any of you have seen an any percent run before, it's the same one that they use to get a bottle quickly uh, instead of going to Kakariko to kill the Cuckoos. Or collect the cocos, not kill them. Uh, <laughs> I wish. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, basically, how get item manipulation works is once you've stored uh, an item or delayed the pickup of an item, like GNS just talked about, uh, which ZFG did with Dekonuts, um, if you walk in front of a treasure chest such that your A button says open, um, the game will actually change the item that it plans to give you. And when you surface from the water, it gives you something else. Um, and so ZFG now has is, the hammer. Yep, yep. Has the <laughs> this is not there. <laughs> right. So what's okay. super special about this uh, is that normally you have like one treasure chest to work with. Like for example, any percent they use the uh, the dungeon map chest, which is upstairs. Uh, and touching a dungeon map chest when you do this glitch gives you a bottle with blue potion in it. Touching a chest with Zelda's letter in it doesn't just give you one item. It can give you any item depending on what direction you're facing. And so if you take all the directions that ZFG can face and divide it into wedges of 256 of the whole circle, uh, there are 256 items in the game, and each wedge corresponds to a different item that he can get. 
And so what ZFG is doing right now is repeatedly doing the glitch over and over again, uh, facing slightly different directions, precisely to select what item he's going to get from the chest over and over, and we're going to get a bunch of items from it. Right. So that all that crazy setup in the beginning was just to put Zelda's letter in a chest, which normally you only get from Zelda. It's not in a chest. And doing Gim with Zelda's letter in that chest is what allows us to get basically anything. And yeah. we will prove later that it is Zelda's letter. Yeah. So you don't just have to take our word for it. So uh, this is the trick I mentioned earlier where like I could get any item from this and uh, really if I wanted to, I could get every item in the game with this and it might make the run, you know, a little bit less interesting. Uh, so for the purposes of this run, I'm only going to do it for a certain number of items. So a lot of the, the items that are really cool and interesting to get, uh, I'm going to keep them, you know, do, do it the uh, other interesting way, like not using this glitch. And I'm primarily using this glitch to get items that uh, are not really that interesting to get. A lot of them are like skipping cutscenes or skipping other uninteresting gameplay. Um, so yeah, not not fully making use of it to the max, uh, just for the sake of uh, entertainment. But uh, max entertainment, definitely, uh, in this run. Yeah. Right. And um, there's actually a newer way to achieve pretty much the same effect. Uh, it's a new trick that a bunch of people have been working on in Goron City. Um, unfortunately, it was worked out a little bit too late before the run here, so we weren't able to put this in the run, but... Definitely look out for speedruns of OOT coming up. Yeah, the whole, sp whole OOT speedrunning scene is going to change a lot in the future, um, just from this. Yeah, for, for reference, the thing that Fig mentioned, uh, it was found, like, I want to say two weeks ago, but it actually requires different setups on different versions. And the setup on the GameCube version, which I'm playing on, was found the day GDQ started, which is a little late to uh, implement that quickly, so. Because you've yeah. got to remember that every trick in this game is not just like, oh, that trick exists now, I'll just do it. You yeah. have to spend hours grinding it, learning it, you know, finding out exactly every way, every detail about the trick, and then how do I deal with it if I mess up something? And, you know, there's so much to consider, there's just not enough time to just, you know, slot it into the run. This, this stuff takes days and weeks and months to plan out. Um, in fact, the original glitch that, read, that led to this uh, was found, I think, what, three months ago or something now? Yeah, um, very late October or something. And it took us this long. Like, it's took, taken us three months, or, you know, however long it's been, of non-stop work mm -hmm. to get all this stuff to work. So I originally found that, you know, I tried to... <laughs> it's actually a video. I tried to boomerang a skull tool token in Forest Temple and in the main room, and I left the room and came back in again. And suddenly, there was a door attached to my boomerang. And I, I was like, and this is new, right? This, this is new. And um, that led to everything. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so I, it's actually funny. I was watching ZFG's stream at the time, hoping that I could bring a Skulltuller token to one of the rooms in the dungeon to help with another trick. And then I randomly moved a door. Um, and at first, we were like, oh, cool. We can move stuff. Like, we can move the position of stuff. And then a few of us realized, actually, the way the game handles data, you can't just, you know, changing the location of something is just writing to its location data. So maybe we could write to some other data, like the, the contents of a chest. Um, and I worked pretty hard on that and uh, eventually produced a video where I managed to change the contents of a chest in Dodongo's Caverns, actually the, the uh, bomb chest, and turned it into a prescription. And then, and of course, this wasn't just me. Um, Fig helped me. Um, work out how, how all this memory stuff even works. Fig's like kind of a genius in my mind when it comes to this stuff. Like I didn't know any about uh, this you know, me memory manipulation. I learned to use a tool called Spectrum, which is made by MZX. Um, figured out that you could put, well, we, we kind of knew that in theory you'd be able to put Zelda's Lester in this chest. And e Exodus, yeah, that one. Exodus was the one that first told us that Zelda's letter would be the one that would allow us to get any item. Um, it was too, it was like, Slingshot is kind of manipulatable, but Zelda's letter would be amazing because it's, it's based on Link's angle. So huge shout-outs to Exodus, shout-outs to Fig, shout-outs to Danny for all the like ridiculously precise setups you're seeing. Uh, there's so many people to shout-out. Um, Italia, Tharo, Roman, um, you got to help me out here. We got Bash. 
Well, yeah, Fashion gets yeah. Finally, Fash gets credit. <laughs> fine. Um, no, but yeah, absolutely Fash. Um, Shout out to Smash Mac for finding that if you yeah. die and revive with a fairy underwater, you get to repeat the GIM glitch over and over again without constantly recollecting Dekka Nuts, which is super important here. Shout out to ZFG for being pretty much one of the only people in the community that tried to get this into a run. <laughs> Um, because everyone else is just, it's very complicated, and a lot of people wanted to wait until more research was done. Um, and this I, I couldn't itself, wait, it was too cool. This itself is, is probably the hardest use of this glitch SRM, the one in Deku Tree. So the fact that you're even doing this, CFG, is, is kind of still blowing my mind. Yeah, I was kind of scared. <laughs> thank, you but, for, uh, thank you for that. Seems like it's working out. Yeah, it's, it's going perfectly. It couldn't, it couldn't be better right now. Um, so do you, do you maybe want to list all the items you're getting? Yeah, so this is actually the last uh, out-of-bounds item I'm getting. So the, all the items I got were Hammer, Ocarina of Time, Light Arrows, Requiem of Spirit, Epona's Song, uh, Iron Boots, Feroz Wind, and the final one here should be Din's Fire. Um, I will check all of those in just a second. All right, let's see, I got everything. Got my Iron Boots, Requiem and Opponent Song. All right, yeah, so that's all the items I want, except for one more. So I got to get a Deku Stick. So I deleted uh, Deku Stick earlier because of um, equip swapping the ball and stuff. That sets my item value to one or zero. I have to go back in front of that chest to redo this. I got one freebie item that I won't be able to repeat the glitch for. And this is going to be a heart container. I just got one extra heart. So now the glitch is finally deactivated. Everything is over. And now we can grab this chest the Zelda's letter chest that led to everything. <laughs> and there it is. CFG is a literal god. Yeah. I have no idea. No one else can do that. All right, back to a little bit more normal stuff. Not, uh, actually, not really. <laughs> well, <laughs> just kidding. Norm, normal <laughs> stuff compared to everything uh, that just happened, but you know, OOT yeah. is a little bit far from normal. It's kind of funny, in practice, we were saying that what you just saw was so hard to explain. Just because it's so complicated, it took us three months to understand it. So, you know, explaining it in five minutes is difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize I could hold my breath for 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> it turns out. Um, so the rest of this run, it's like hard to not take it for granted, all these simple tricks that are coming up, but we're going to try our best anyway to explain them all. <laughs> so, um, I mentioned earlier that I had a bottle on B going back in time as an adult. Uh, now if you look at my B button, I have not a bottle. Uh, I got missing no there. <laughs> so, so, when you have a bottle on any item and you go back in time and forward in time, the game has to check if a, a bottle needs to be updated. Because, you know, say you have a fish as adult and you go back to child and you dump out that fish, the game has to update the bottle to make sure that the fish is no longer there as adult. Uh, but when that bottle is on the B button, it doesn't quite do that update properly. It instead checks C right to do the update. And so it updates based on my C right item. I equipped Broken Goron Sword as, on C right as child, which is uh, part of the Begoran Sword trading quest. And that item points to a region in memory that in total adds up to 225. So it puts item value 225 on D, which is that glitchy mess. Uh, what that's his medallions and uh, a couple songs that made yep. that number. Yep. Um, and uh, what's important about this glitchy item is that it acts like eye drops, which is the final item in the Begorn, or second final item in the Begorn Sword trading quest. But I can't give him eye drops right away. The game actually checks your inventory slot to make sure that you, ha you have at least a prescription or, or higher in the Begorn Sword trading quest. So I give him the Broken Goron Sword to get the prescription, then I can give him the glitched item, which is eye drops, which he accepts. I, 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 we've been calling them lie drops. Yeah, yeah lie drops, the, the great name. But uh, I don't know if he should be putting those in his eyes. Yeah. <laughs> I do not recommend putting missing no in your eyes. Yeah, the knockoff eye drops, not sure how, how good those are. But anyway, it worked, got claim check. Yeah, so uh, after getting the claim check, you have to wait three days to get the Begoran Sword. Uh, what it really is, is waiting the transition from night to day three times. So since it's night, um, it stays a little bit of time. While I'm uh, playing Sun Song and advancing it three days, I'm also going to go head out to get magic. Magic is right over here. Very convenient. It's kind of funny that, you know, we have spells like uh, Din's Fire, and yet we haven't got magic yet to use them <laughs> until now. Yeah.
we've been talking for a long time. Maybe time for some donations. Yeah, this would be a good place. I have lots of donations for you. We have a $25 donation from Definia who says, my husband's dream was to make video games and introduced me to the joy of Ocarina of Time. I lost him to cancer many years ago, but he still lives in my heart container. Good luck, CF team. I know, that's really sweet. And applause. We also have a $25 donation from Rapper Brewer, who says, every Christmas, my siblings and I play Ocarina of Time together, passing the controller after finishing, finishing a dungeon. It's fun seeing it get broken, so we can try to do some of these glitches next time we get together. You should. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, a lot of these glitches may seem intimidating, but there's actually lots of very simple glitches to do. Um, stuff like uh, the infinite story glitch, which is pretty common throughout the run. That's a very easy trick, um, you know, lots of people's first trick. Um, that's a, a good one to start with if you want to just like try learning some stuff. And uh, if you're kind of worried, you want to learn some runs, but you're kind of intimidated, there's some great resources online. Uh, we have a great uh, OT Discord server. You can come in and, you know, if you're learning, struggling with something, not sure why something doesn't work, just come in and ask, post a video, and we can help you. Um, the OT community is like one of the most amazing communities I've ever seen. Everyone's so helpful, so knowledgeable. We get we get newbies off the ground in like two seconds flat. Yeah. And it's such a rewarding yeah. game to play and you know, learn these tricks, do a speed run. It's great. Alright, so all the time passed. Finally give him um, prescription after three days, get my Bigoran sword, which won't ever actually be used in the run. <laughs> uh, just so, show. yeah, side note, um, I'm never going to use a sword as adult again. Adult will never actually have a sword on D again throughout the rest of the run. Child will use it a little bit. But uh, B button is surprisingly useful for a lot of other items that are not sword. Yeah, who needs sword anyway? All right, so I just got the first magic upgrade, and I'm immediately going to go get uh, the bigger one. So I can do a mega flip here. And uh, this mega flip will take me directly into the fairy fountain that's gonna give me double uh, double magic. So normally to get in here you need hammer. I did get hammer, but uh, it's kind of slow. Just mega flip in is faster. So as far as uh, not using swords, you notice ZFG equipped Deca sticks to C button there. Uh, Deca sticks actually have the same exact attack power as the master sword. They break, of course, but uh, we have a lot of them. Yeah, and plus uh, I can use the infinite sword glitch, which uh, prevents the Deku Stick from breaking. Not only that, but there's a different trick which I'll use later on, just called Broken Deku Stick, where you break it in the air and you can still use the broken part, even though uh, Link is supposed to normally put it away. So, yeah, sword, um, Deku Sticks and Hammer are basically going to be my Master Sword replacements for the rest of the run, at least for adult, since I won't be using any kind of sword as adult. Interestingly, uh, sticks, using sticks as adult will crash on the N64 version of the game, but uh, we're playing on GameCube, and the GameCube emulator is okay with sticks as adult. So yep. It works for us. You'll notice when they break, uh, you actually get the same visual as breaking a giant's knife. Yeah, uh, adult links, uh, uh, sword breaking type item is giant's knife, and so. Um, you know, he's not supposed to be using Dex as a doll, so he just ends up playing the Giant's Knife breaking. Uh, the reverse is also true. If you break Giant's Knife as child, it will actually uh, show a Deku Stick breaking, which is kind of funny. And again, those Deku Sticks got on C in the first place. Adults not supposed to be able to use Deku Sticks, uh, so they have to use Equip Swing again to be able to get those on the C. Yeah, so speaking of Deku Sticks, I'm going to break a bunch. I don't want a whole lot. I only want 13, no more, no less. Too heavy. That'll That'll be important coming up soon. So I want to go in the Goron shop, but it's closed right now until I blow up the rolling Goron. I don't want to talk to him though, so I'm going to break into the shop. Just going to bomb myself here, fall out of bounds, and go right in. So this is why I got rupees earlier. I can buy the Goron tunic. This, uh, so I mentioned again, like the rolling Goron that gives you the Goron tunic, he talks for like a full minute. And obviously buying that tunic is way faster. Plus, I need a lot of bombs. I was very low on bombs and... Um, uh, wait, uh, oh yeah. My bottles are messed up because um, I messed up the bug stuff earlier. So I'm like forgetting what bottles are what. So 
So I'm going to head back to Temple of Time now. Uh, so we talked about Bottle Adventure earlier, how I can get different items on my B button as adult. I'm going to do that again. Um, it requires going back in time and forward in time. But this time, I'm not really going to bother doing anything as child. I'm really only going to go back to child just to activate the glitch. So before I do that, I do need to get Bottle back on my B button. So I'm going to catch these bugs over uh, this glitched item on B. And this also gives me, uh, since I had light arrows on C right, that actually gave me the Spirit Temple boss key. That'll be useful later. And so the reason I wanted 13 Deku Sticks now is because when I go forward in time, I'm going to equip the Fairy on C right. And I mentioned Fairy, I mentioned earlier Fairy points of Deku Sticks, which is how I got 20 Deku Sticks earlier. This time I'm going to equip Fairy on C right. This way, the game will look at my Deku Stick count to determine what item is going to be put on B. And I have 13 Deku Sticks, so it's going to be item value 13 on B. Item value 13 on B happens to be Furore's Wind. And so there it is. So is that going to be useful so that you can, you know, go into a dungeon and then, you know, you might get bored of playing, so you might want to go to bed, so you can set for his wind. Yeah, yeah, it, and, it's uh, good to, you know, to get day. back to where you want to be. Now, the, the reason for his wind on B is so important is normally for his wind is restricted to only dungeons, but when an item is on B, it's usable wherever you can use your sword, which is almost anywhere except, you know, like houses. So basically, I can use Furrow's Wind wherever I want now, which is super good. Yeah, but first, even though you know I can use the outside dungeons now, first thing I'm going to do is actually go in a dungeon, which is Water Temple. So I'm going to go in by clipping out of bounds, just do a jump slash there, clip out of bounds, and swim to the loading zone. So here in Water Temple, I really only need two things. I need to get the long shot, and I need to just beat the dungeon. I'm going to go get long shot first. Normally, the way to go get long shot is uh, you, know, you meet Rudo, you get some keys, you go fight Dark Link, and the reward you get for fighting Dark Link is, uh, is the long shot. I don't really want, want to fight Dark Link. I'm going to take, uh, take the scenic route. So I'm going to clip out of bounds there. So that was a ledge clip. I target the ledge as soon as I grab the... I target the wall as soon as I grab the ledge, and that moves Link's body towards the wall when you grab the ledge, which clips him out of bounds, so they can just drop out of bounds and go into the water. So this lets me get to this room a little bit early. And I'm going to cross this gap and take a lot of damage from this Tektite. Uh, I don't want to die yet, but I do want to be at low health. So I'm just going to let this guy beat me up after I set Furrow's Wind. Sometimes you gotta let the enemies win. Yeah. He just wants a hug. All right. And I'm gonna get ISG before I leave the room. So the reason I want to get ISG here is to hover up here. So normally you're supposed to come into this room from the top, but I'm gonna hover up to where you normally are supposed to enter here. Can I go through this room backwards? So something interesting to note here uh, is that when you hover, um, your ability to walk or move kind of takes on the properties of whatever floor is directly underneath you. And directly underneath ZFG, a little bit to the side right now, is a slippery slope as part of like a pipe underwater. And when you're on a slippery slope, you can't side off or backflip. So ZFG has to be very careful to maneuver this hover so that he's never over the slippery slope or else he won't be able to continue hovering. So there's a gate here. You have to shoot an eye switch uh, to open it, but I can shoot the eye switch through the wall there. And now I'm going to get in the water here. So I'm going to, I have very low health, which means I'm going to have a very short timer right here. Oh, come on. Um, so I'm going to want to pull out my hook shot, and I'm going to, I want to die at the same time that um, I shoot the hook shot target here. Oh, no. Oh, um... Can you equip spot fairy? Uh, uh, no, you can't. How do I get Dagger Sticks? Uh, oh, there's, there's a fairy in this room. Okay. Yeah, just... I'll just do this. Okay. There's a fairy in this room that I can get. Okay, so that was a frame early. 
So I died. I wanted to die at the same time. I instead uh, did a little bit too early. So luckily, there's a fairy in here as a backup. So you notice DFG pause buffering there. Um, he actually wasn't pause buffering and advancing one frame at a time like you might be used to. Um, timers in this game, even if you don't advance a frame, uh, timers will advance one frame on their own, uh, just like in between pauses. And so you can just kind of mash the start button without any special timing. Okay, so unfortunately, since I refilled my health, I'm gonna be waiting a bit. Uh, how was your day, guys? <laughs> so this setup, I think, was from... this uh, setup, I think, was found by Seaborn, right? Yeah. And Seaborn has done quite a lot for this category. Uh, a few others have as well. Um, we should mention the NSR runners before this. Uh, Skirty. Skirty, yeah. Because even before SRM, this is a really cool category. And there's so many cool strats. And we have to thank so many people. <laughs> so many cool people. So the hookshot jump you guys saw in Dodongo's Cavern earlier to get the bombs early, uh, that one, you know, it went pretty high. The bridge was kind of high, high up above him. Um, but when you're underwater here, you actually have different physics. Lift off. So this still going. Yeah. So this is a really huge jump. I'm way, uh, way above Water Temple right, right now. So that jump was so fast it got me through the ceiling. And when I land, I'm actually landing in Darklink's room. So this is actually the room I fight Darklink in, but completely unloaded. And the room I'm going towards is the room where the long shot is. Uh, there happens to be hookshotable collision on the bottom of the door frame. So I can hookshot the ground here. Who knows why? Yeah, it, it's very strange. One specific tile on the floor. There's actually a few instances that uh, of that in Water Temple where there's parts of the walls or ground that are just hookshotable for no reason. Yeah. And then I have to load this room by falling down here and then jump slashing. Now the long shot room's loaded, and here's the long shot. And so I set for Rosewind earlier, so I can go straight back to the beginning of the dungeon. So now with long shot, I can go straight to the boss. So one interesting thing about Water Temple is that in speedruns, normally, to get to the boss, you either, uh, you normally do like a Hess with hover boost to get over here. It's very rare in speedruns you actually use the long shot here because the water level is almost always lowered. This is a rare instance of never lowering the water level in Water Temple, and so we actually just long shot over. The, the normal strat. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, no. I have no idea how to do this room if you don't get a first try. <laughs> okay, it, it works. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to set for Rosewind uh, for um, an upcoming cutscene skip. Uh, I don't have the boss key, but I can get through the boss door anyway. I'm going to do a short hover here. Set a bomb down, and I'm going to get hit by the bomb as soon as I drop from the hover. And that boosts me through the door. That's called a ground clip. Um, when you're over certain floors, that floor being one of them, um, if you have a, a bunch of downward speed and lateral speed at the same time, you can just go straight through, uh, straight through walls. Um, and so when you're in a hover, gravity's constantly acting on you and pulling you down. Uh, and so he snapped down to the ground at like max fall speed instantly. And then the bomb gave him the lateral speed with the pushback, uh, so he went straight through the door. All right, so Morpha is a pretty simple boss. Uh, the general strat for Morpha is you kind of just drag him towards the corner and then just beat him up in the corner. So um, I kind of just have to wait. Well, you can sort of skip waiting for the tentacle to be made if you get, happen to get lucky. <laughs> Not quite lucky enough. 
It, it's even if you get it, the first shot is kind of hard. Come on. So I can just drag him towards the corner. Did I jump slash? I don't know. I don't think, think so. Oh no. Oh no. That's fine. Just takes it. Okay. Ahead. Yeah. Well, this might be a good cool. time to talk about power crouch stabbing. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> stabs in this game. Stabs in this game don't actually have their own set damage value, uh, and they take on the damage value and damage type of whatever the last attack you did was. Uh, so when, when CFG asked, did I jump slash? Um, normally what you want to do is jump slash before you start that phase of the fight so that you store that damage value to your crouch stabs, and so you can just do a lot of damage really quickly. Yeah, unfortunately, I somehow forgot, but, um, you know, I made the fight a little longer, but not a big deal. So here, I want to grab this park container and uh, beat the dungeon. I normally step into the blue warp, but that causes a long cutscene. I do want to get the war medallion, I don't want to watch the cutscene, so I'm going to step in the blue warp with Furrow's Wind, which you normally cannot use Furrow's Wind in boss rooms, so this is another really important thing of Furrow's Wind on B. I'm going to warp away right as the screen fades out, and I get the war medallion, don't have to watch the cutscene. And one interesting thing to note there is that uh, Lake Hylia filling up with water is actually triggered during the cutscene. So by skipping it, Lake Hylia will never actually be filled with water again. And now I'm going to head to Spirit Temple. We're pretty mean to the Zoras. Yeah. You kind of just leave Ruto in the boomerang room. You don't even fight Baron You never give her. King Zora his chance in the spotlight. Yeah. Wow. We're so mean. Our speedrunners so mean. All right, so I want to get Ice G off this way, and I'm gonna let him. I'm gonna use him to start a hover. And uh, so normally I have to go through a lot of Spirit Temple to get to some outside hands, where you can get some cool items. I'm just going to get to the top of the hands from outside. Gonna do a hover here. In this hover, I can uh, just barely stand on a little thing here and backflip onto the seam. From here, I can climb up here and long shot the silver gauntlets chest. Don't actually care about silver gauntlets, I just want to get up here and do a super slide. And equip hover boots. This will let me cross this really big gap, get over to the other hand where a mirror shield is. Oh, I got the fast chest. And now I can go into Spirit Temple from uh, really high up. And this skips a lot of uh, the internal uh, Spirit Temple part. So here I want to do uh, a trick I mentioned earlier, Broken Deku Stick. So I just broke this Deku Stick in midair, and Link didn't actually put it away. Uh, he only puts it away if you're actually on, on the ground when you break it. And so I can keep using that broken part as a weapon which means I wanted to break a stick every single hit, and so I can use it for um, hooking this iron up quickly. And I don't think we mentioned this earlier, but when you're using the stick as a double, it's actually invisible. Uh, you can't throw the stick. Yep. You can, see the, you can see the slash, but not the actual stick itself. And uh, another thing you might not know is that the stick is actually stronger than the Kikiri sword. In fact, it's the same strength as the Master Sword. So by using the stick here, it doesn't take longer than the Master Sword. So the Golden Spirit Temple here, I actually just want to go down to the main room, the room with the big statue. Uh, instead of normally you want to kind of go up the temple. Uh, to do that, I have to get, uh, get through this room. I have to kill that Beemos and some Anubis here. Uh, the Anubis moves based on Link's movement, and so I'm kind of moving around the room to make them move into the fire, which kills them. Uh, this pot has a bomb in it, which I can grab, which is really nice. So here, um, the boss room is in the uh, statue's head here. So I'm going to climb the statue and get into the head early. So I pull a bomb here, and uh, this will let me flip out of bounds and quickly back inbounds and get up on the shoulder. From here, I can do some trick jumps to move around to here. 
from here I can hookshot into the head, hit that, and open the door. And he again. I forgot, he had the boss key because he RBA'd light arrows earlier. Yep. Oh, this might be a good time for a donation. Absolutely. We have a $250 donation from Brandon, who says, donating for the absurd boomerang glitch in OOT. My brain was long ago melted when ZFG said, and that's the end of phase one. <laughs> we also have $25 from Anonymous, who says, you're doing a great job, ZFG, from a couple fans from Rhode Island. Thanks. All right, so for this fight here, I'm not gonna straight up find the Iron Knuckle. Uh, I actually wanna lure the Iron Knuckle into a corner uh, so I can try to skip the cutscene. Gonna go over here and do a setup for Broken Decker Stick for, for actually fighting. Gonna get the Iron Knuckle down to low health. So the Iron Knuckle is one hit away from dying. Gonna lure him in the corner. Drop a bomb, hook shot to clip out of bounds. And the bomb's gonna kill the Iron Knuckle. And this is gonna skip a whole cutscene. Uh, there's normally a cutscene with like the Iron Knuckle, the armor falling off and revealing Naburu, and that's just completely skipped. In case it wasn't obvious there, ZFG hook shot at the enemy itself. You can hook shot onto those Iron Knuckles. Uh, he's able to hook through the wall that way. Speedrunner's favorite boss. <laughs> no. uh, it's a pretty random boss. Um, basically, these witches are just going to be flying around. Uh, they're going to shoot at whenever they dang well please. Um, hopefully, yeah. it'll be soon. Sometimes they can shoot multiple times from the same spot without flying in between. Um, so you might hear people talking about doubles or triples shooting yeah. in the same spot. That's super fast. We want that to happen. Um, but sometimes they just decide to hang around. So we'll cross our fingers. Yeah, Tornova is uh, a lot of people's favorite boss casually, but you ask any speedrunner what their least favorite... Oh, I actually got a quick shot here. Okay, that's good. Uh, but yeah, you ask any speedrunner their least favorite boss, it's almost always Tornova. Um, so I was shooting the hook shot there to keep one of them in place. If I shoot at them, then they kind of try to like dodge it, and um, that just helps keep them in place, makes it easier to shoot them. Some RNG manipulation. Yeah. <laughs> this is going very well so far. Oh, no doubles. No two quick ones. <laughs> All right, that was actually not too bad. Yeah, pretty good luck. Yeah, like probably the best like you can get without a double. This phase though uh, can be random if you don't do it right. Um, but at the very beginning here, before you do any damage to the combined twin robot, she's always going to shoot three of the same elements in a row, uh, and that's pretty useful because we can actually kill her in one cycle with uh, fast enough damage. So we never have to deal with the randomness. And also, shooting uh, the hookshot there actually does speed up the fight. It actually makes her move to the next platform faster. Which is pretty interesting, because in phase one, you use the hookshot to keep one of them in place. And in phase two, you use it to move her to the next one faster. Uh, this is a good time for donations. Sure thing. We have a $150 donation from Huff and Stuff 159. He says, no matter how often I see ZFG do a run, it never quits being amazing. His skill plus the knowledge of the couch is making this my favorite run of the events thus far. I agree, this has been great. Yeah, I, I've been thoroughly <laughs> enjoying this too, actually. Yeah, this is going pretty well. <laughs> we got a front row seat here. Yeah, this is the best movie I ever saw. 
We've also got a $25 donation from Lumeria, who says, after years of playing this game with my siblings, seeing this run brings back wonderful memories. My mother is currently nine years in remission for melanoma. So happy to be a part of this experience with you all. Lesson three. Congratulations. That's awesome. This is from a little bit ago, since we already filled the glitch exhibition, but I figured I should mention this $1,000 donation from Kumakichi. Saying, I can't get enough Ocarina of Time. Let's get this glitch expe uh, expedition going. <laughs> All right, so yet another cutscene skip here, same as the Water Temple one. Just gonna warp away right as the screen fades out. Get the medallion, don't have to watch the cutscene. And I can leave right away. So uh, here in Grotto, uh, Val or, uh, Desert Colossus, uh, I want to do a super slide here. And there's this heart piece on a rock. Uh, normally you have to use a magic bean to get it, but I can just use a super slide to get over here. A uh, nice, quick, convenient heart piece. Uh, especially since I have to go to the fairy fountain next to get Nero's love. Um, just right on the way. So an interesting thing about Nero's love, um, I was actually considering using uh, the glitch in Decatree to get Nero's love, uh, but it turned out to actually be like, so I wanted to do like, you know, stuff that skips cutscenes and it was only like 10 seconds faster and I didn't want to like add more difficulty on top of that. So I kind of just decided not to do it. And also a change of scenery from Deku Tree, you know, you don't want to yeah, spend yeah. an hour in there. I'm sure Chad loves these cutscenes anyway. Where are you headed next, EFG? I am going back to the forest. We've been in the forest quite a lot this run, but uh, you know, it's, it's a nice place. I'm gonna head back there again after this. There's a lot to do there. <laughs> yeah, probably the second most played song. Yeah, usually Bolero is the one because Bolero kind of exists in like a overworld hub. Yeah, Bolero, to... Bolero is so close to so many things. All right, so th there's a few reasons I want to go back to the forest. Uh, one is I actually want to go back to Deku Tree. I actually, uh, even though I spent so long in Decatree, I never beat it and I never got the item that's actually, the, that's normally in the Decatree, the slingshot. Should probably go back and actually get those. Uh, also, I want to set Fora's Wind right here. Uh, I left and re-entered Sacred Forest Meadow. That was actually not an accident. I need to set Fora's Wind specifically Sacred Forest, in Sacred Forest Meadow from Lost Woods. Uh, the entrance point actually will be important here. And there's also a Deku Nut upgrade I need to get. I still have not gotten Deku Nuts this run, and I should probably do that. You guys want to take care of this one? Yeah, sure. So one of these guys sells Deku Nuts, uh, and the other one sells arrows. Um, and every NPC has like a, an invisible circle around them within which you can actually collect the I thing that they'll give you. <laughs> Gotta retry. I, uh, I need 70 rupees. <laughs> <laughs> Taking a detour. Okay, luckily there is a five right out here. But, um, so the, the collection range for these two guys actually overlaps a little bit in between them. Uh, and so if you do this in a certain way, uh, you can delay the collection, which is what ZFG is doing with the pause buffered shield here, to get into a special state, which delays the collection of the items that he's going to give you. Uh, then he's going to get into the overlap region between their collection ranges, and then exit the state and collect them both at once. Uh, and if you do that, the arrows actually become a secondary Decanut upgrade. And since Decanut upgrades are progressive, which means you always get the next best one, getting two in a row means you get the highest upgrade. Yeah, and the reason I need 70 rupees there is because uh, I, need to buy, I need to buy both of them, and they only check your rupees at uh, the start when you actually say yes. And the, the higher one there is uh, 70 rupees, so I just had to go out and get a little bit more. 
Uh, I, I actually, if you do that with more rupees, it actually costs 110 rupees total. So if you do it with more, you actually lose 110, but it only requires 70. So to get into Decatry, I'm going to do this Hess here. Uh, so this Hess lets me get on that out of bounds area that I was on earlier, uh, but a lot faster. So basically the same thing I did as child to enter Decatry, just skipping the cutscene by going, well actually there's not even a cutscene as adult, but you know, going out of bounds. Adult Link normally can't enter Decatry at all, but again, the Decatry's mouth is not loaded, so I can just uh, walk right in. So Zichi, earlier you mentioned that you got all three spiritual stones from some RBA, so why do we need to beat the Decatry? Yeah, so I don't actually need to beat the Decatry, but the Decatry has a very interesting property uh, where the blue warp at the end can be used for a glitch called the wrong warp. It can basically take me, teleport me to other interesting places in the game that I normally shouldn't be able to get to or get to much quicker. And so even though I don't need to beat Decatry, uh, the wrong warp I can do is very convenient. And in addition to that, I do get a free heart container from Goma. Uh, again, I, I kind of get to pick and choose where I get my hearts in this run, because I have a lot of options with glitches on where how I can get hearts. But um, if I pass by like a free quick heart container, it's very good. So here I'm going to do a mega flip. And this mega flip is going to clip me through the ground. I'm going to equip hover boots, and I'm going to slide out of bounds for a bit. And I'm going to fall. And as I fall, I will hit the loading zone for the boss room. So again, uh, like I mentioned earlier, in Forest Temple, all the collision is always loaded for every dungeon, including the loading zone. So all I have to do to get to the loading zone is just find a way to it from out of bounds. And it's just time to kill one of the easier yep. bosses in the game. Yep. Nothing really special here. Quickie. Like I said, nothing special, just, you know, ISG, the usual. Yeah. So you're going to notice ZFG doing some Pharaoh's Wind on the blue warp. Basically the same thing that he did in, uh, in Spirit Temple, in Water Temple. Um, and he didn't get a wrong warp from those dungeons, but he is going to get one here. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, it depends on what kind of cutscene the blue warp intends to take you to. Um, and in the adult dungeons, they take you to cutscenes inside the Chamber of Sages, where a sage will give you a medallion. Uh, and if, if a dungeon takes you straight there, you actually can't do a wrong warp there. Um, but on all the other dungeons, like the Child Dungeons and Fire Temple, uh, you can do a wrong warp from those dungeons. So, uh, where I wrong warp to, this is actually the Saria song cutscene, but it's a little bit different. Uh, you might be able to tell, since Saria's legs are stuck. <laughs> so, this is wrong warping directly into the cutscene on a different map than usual. Uh, where I am right now is not the regular Sacred Force Meadow you'd go to in the game. It's sort of an unused uh, setup for Sacred Force Meadow, and um, it happens to have this cutscene, which is a little bit messed up. Obviously, this didn't make it into the final game for obvious reasons. Until now. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, this map has really interesting properties. It's got like, uh, there's no enemies or anything. There's no grottos. Uh, if you take a look at the sky, the sky has like really fast moving clouds. Yeah, it's really unique. I'll actually show off the clouds uh, after this. So yeah, it's really strange, like this unused map. And one other interesting thing about this is that, um, the uh, cutscene trigger for the regular Saria song still exists, which means when this cutscene ends, I watch it again. <laughs> hope you guys. All the cutscenes good. Yeah. Hope you guys like Saria song. <laughs> yeah. So uh, when I wrong warped into the cutscene, that that wrong warp is directly into the cutscene. I don't like step into any triggers or anything. But when the cutscene ends, the cutscene, the regular cutscene trigger is still there. So I immediately gain control and step into the trigger, which forces me to watch it again. Now, this might seem kind of weird. The purpose of this is that uh, normally the way to activate the Saria Song cutscene is to meet Zelda at Hyrule Castle. I have not met Zelda at Hyrule Castle, and I never will because it's very slow and she talks forever, and I don't want to talk to her. So uh, even though I have to watch this cutscene twice, it's still better than going to meet Zelda. Plus, we already got Zelda's letter. Yeah.
So that'll be it. There won't be a third cutscene, but um, it's not the end of Staria's song. So conveniently, this puts me right outside of Forest Temple, which I do want to go back to. So uh, I never actually got the bow from Forest Temple. And also, you may remember back when I beat the Forest Temple, I didn't get the heart container. That was not an accident. I actually intentionally left the heart container since having more health at that point in the run would be kind of detrimental. So uh, I got to go, go get both of those things. I got to go get the bow and the heart container. Uh, so I got to go get the bow over in this room over here. So there's a uh, Stalfos fight in this room over here that you normally use to get a key. And at the top of this room is another Stalfos fight where I actually get the bow. Now, uh, you might think, oh, I can just like hover up to the top of the room and then go get the bow. It doesn't quite work like that because the uh, fight at the top only activates if Link enters the room above a certain height. So um, in other words, like it just checks to you know, that he's coming in from the upper doors um, just by using the height check. But I can do some cool out-of-bounds stuff to trick that height check and actually get it, get, uh, trigger the fight from this room. Yeah, so what he just did there is called entrance point glitch. He kept the door open uh, by staying close to it. And when he goes far away from the door, uh, the door will close and set his respawn point if he were to void out. Um, so he does a weird shot here to uh, hit the vines, which are in the courtyard nearby in another room. Um, the weird shot is a, a bomb glitch which lets you go underground and shoot from underground. Um, now that he's in the courtyard, he's going to hover and do a, a, ground, a ground clip the same way he got through the Water Temple boss door. Um, just to try that one more time. And then he's going to get out of bounds and void out. Uh, and the spawn point, the spawn point that got set in midair as he was in the middle of that hookshot flight We'll, we'll get used. Just giving more explanation time. <laughs> there, there we go. go. And also, the, the vines that I hookshotted earlier, those are vines in the outer courtyard area. Again, I mentioned all the collision in, in a dungeon is always loaded. That includes stuff like climbable vines and everything. And that's what I hookshotted. And so, since the room that was loaded was the Stalfos room, oh and he God. respawned oh. into the room from so high up, uh, it'll trigger the upper Stalfos fight. So now we just gotta get our way back there. How am I getting that sideways weird shot? That's so rare. Uh... How's your bomb count? Um, it doesn't really matter until later, so it should be fine. What is this? <laughs> this I never ever get these uh, slightly weird shots. Okay, there we go. Okay. So this lets me get back in this room, and so now the uh, that's not what I want. Um, now, the Stalfos fight actually is triggerable, but I still have to get up there, so I have to hover up there. To hover, I really want some bomb shoes, so I'm going to do RBA again. I lose for Rosewind on B. Uh, it served a good purpose, did some good stuff, but its time is over for now. And now I actually have to hover up to the top, so got to get ISG. I'm going to get on this chest and start a big hover. And the reason why he gets on the chest to start the hover is uh, if you start a hover from the ground, if you're too close to the ground when you're hovering, Link will actually snap down to the ground. So you need a, a, a minimum amount of height before the hover will actually stick. So he just uses the chest as that little boost. And he's attacking me in midair, which is pretty scary, but I should be fine. All right, now I'm up here. Now I just fight normally. Well, you know, normally with ISG. <laughs> Kind of funny how when we've been doing this a while, normal kind of has a different meaning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. normal has a very different meaning between speedrunners and casual players. All right, so I got the bow. I still need to get that heart container, so I want to go back to the boss room. So I'm going to do a trick here where I use the hammer on this wall. I'm going to equip the hover bits. 
Gonna slide out of bounds real quickly. And I'm gonna fall. And this will take me directly to the boss loading zone again. Nice. ZSG just learned that one today. <laughs> I, I relearned it. I, I used to do it years ago, and I just forgot about it. But now I remember it again. Uh, yeah. Wait. <laughs> All right, so a bit more of you here. This is just refilling shoe count once again. Always love those bomb shoes. And now I'm going to equip Nira's Love on C right. Nira's Love gives me a bottle in my second bottle slot. So that is all four bottles. And I didn't mean to do that. Um, now I want to do Ocarina items. I tried to do Ocarina items there, but pressed the wrong button. Um, this just lets me play an Ocarina in the boss room. Normally, you can't play Ocarina in boss rooms, but this allows you to. And so this is just a fast way to get out of the boss room so I can actually go back to Temple Time and finally become child again. It's a very musical hammer. Yeah. Wait, I, I don't have my bugs, right? But I do have fish? Okay. <laughs> That's kind of weird. I usually have fish, but not bugs. Or I usually have bugs, but not fish, but it doesn't really matter for this case. You should have bugs in the second bottle that you just RBA. Oh, right, right, right. Okay, so I have both. Okay. Either one's fine. So uh, I go back. I go back to uh, child again. Uh, again, bottle on B as a, is on bottle is on B as adult, which means that uh, once again I will get another unique item on B uh, when I become adult again. Spoilers: It's Frozen Wind again because it's really good. So now I gotta do. Gotta, gotta go back to market. Um, there's actually one thing I gotta get quickly in market. So I actually just recently got the slingshot. Uh, a bit later than you usually get it. But uh, I can't actually get slingshot upgrades before I get the regular slingshot. Because uh, normally, when I, when I get the, when you get the slingshot, if you have another slingshot bag before you get the slingshot, you always get downgraded. So it's never worth it to get a slingshot upgrade before slingshot, because you'll always just downgrade. So I have to, you know, wait to get slingshot upgrades until after that. Uh, so this minigame here is randomized as adult, but always the same pattern as child. So that's why I could just like easily know which ones are coming out. And gotta get some rupees. I'm very low on rupees, so I'm gonna sell my fish. Don't need the fish anymore. Served a good purpose. And I'm gonna save warp and head back to Kukuri Forest. You can probably squeeze in a donation or two here. Sure thing. We have a $50 donation from Captain Tempest, who says, as my friend aptly put it, quote, you could write a PhD dissertation on this game and how broken it is, end quote. Good luck on the rest of the run, ZFG, and great job on the mic, Kung Fu. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> we also have a $250 donation from Richard E.B. <laughs> I love the crowd cheer. And this says, yay, ZFG! <laughs> <laughs> so heading back up to Lost Woods, I just got that one slingshot upgrade, and the other slingshot upgrade happens to be right there, right at the beginning of Lost Woods, so I can get that quickly. And then we're on to the best part of the run. Ocarina minigame? No. <laughs> Come on. Slingshot minigame. And they aim. <laughs> so yeah, I just gotta shoot this target. This guy's gonna give me a uh, slingshot upgrade. So actually, there's a way to dupe this, and uh, originally it was just kind of slow and not really worth it. There's a faster method found recently, and I wanted to do it. The only reason I couldn't do it is because I couldn't find a ruby route that would work out properly, and I didn't have enough rupees, which kind of sucks. Like, just rupees were the only reason I couldn't do it. Um, all right, so there's Skull Kid there. Uh, Skull Kid gives you a heart piece if you play Saria's song. What happens if there's lots of Skull Kids? Oh, no. Stay tuned. Uh, using a slingshot here in a hover allows you to kill the backwards momentum from the hover so that you know, normally when you backflip, Link goes really far backwards, and if you try to hover, uh, 
he would just like backflip away from the explosion, it would never hit the shield. So you use the slingshot here to shorten the backflip so that the Bonchu explosion actually hits Link's shield. So I'm going to Mega Flip past this low trigger here, which means I can hit it from behind, just like the Skull Trouble thing, but with Skull Kids this time. Okay, no, wait. Okay, that's three, four, five, six. Okay, so I just loaded 25 Skull Kids, and everything is fine. Stream's not frozen, no dropping frames, nothing's wrong on your end. The game screen is actually frozen right now. So there are so many Skull Kids loaded right now, the game cannot handle showing them all, and so this is what you're going to be seeing for a while. Uh, that's three. I remember to just back up count. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, I mentioned, you know, Skull Kid, one Skull Kid is one heart piece. Lots of Skull Kids will give lots of heart pieces. Um, should be five. So I'm going to play Sorry a Song 21 times, and I'm going to get 21 heart pieces from these guys. Six. And uh, I loaded a few extra. Uh, one for safety, and also one is required. So I can't play the same number of Sorry a Songs as there are Skull Kids or else the last Skull Kid is just going to give me his heart piece, and I don't get any others. That's eight? Yep. Eight. eight. Okay. Um, so I have to play less than 25, and then the others are just for safety. Uh, nine. Because if I, if I fail a song, that counts as minus one. Ten. Eleven. And again, if you just came in, nothing's wrong. <laughs> this is all fine. 12. I hope Chat Crew is not panicking. <laughs> 13. So this seems like it's taking a lot of time, um, but. The, the payoff is, on average, these heart pieces are pretty fast relative to most other ones that you'll be able to get. Um, so you just pick and choose which ones are going to be faster than being able to get them like this. Uh, 16? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Seventeen. Eighteen. Almost there. Three more. Nineteen. You guys like Sorry Song? It's a pretty good song. Sure do. Oh. Twenty. We're about, we're about to get our screen back, but it's gonna. Uh, that, that's that's twenty, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Twenty-one coming up. All right. Okay. Next slide coming up. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> and again, nothing's wrong the stream. Yeah. This Every, is what the game everything looks like right now. Everything is fine. ZSG just has a custom texture pack. Yeah. <laughs> so, the next part of the trick is I have to talk to all the Skull Kids. So now I am just mashing A so I can talk to all of them. I have to actually talk to them before they can give me the heart piece. So I gotta play 21 songs, then talk to them 21 times. Then after this, I can get back on the stump and I will collect my 21 heart pieces. And uh, you may be wondering why the screen looks like this. <laughs> um, I don't think we know the exact reason, but it has to do with when the screen freezes and then playing songs while the screen freezes. It just, um, this. <laughs> but yeah, we, it have, doesn't. we have good news about this new texture pack. Uh, we're gonna see it for a while. Yeah, hope you guys like this. Or at least parts of it. Uh, hey. 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 You can do a donation. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
figured we had some time. We have a $200 donation from Lulu Casserole who says, you got a huge rupee. This rupee is worth a whopping 200 rupees. We, <laughs> we also have a $500 donation. Woo! I think this is really appropriate. It's from Navi Says Listen, and it says, hey, listen. Been hearing that a bit. Yeah, <laughs> just a little. <laughs> All right, now, finally collecting my hearts. There's one, two, and here they all are gonna come right now. Probably squeeze in another quick donation. <laughs> yeah, no problem. We have a $50 donation from Nikolaide who says, there's nothing quite like the beautiful elegance of N64 Zeldas being methodically deconstructed piece by piece. Bravo, ZFG, bravo. Thanks. It's true though, we've, uh, we've managed to do some pretty amazing things with this yeah. game in the... Yeah, the Rizaldians Zold <laughs> being broken is Pretty fantastic. Many of us have written our own custom yeah. tools to try and work out what, what the heck's going on in these games and yeah. a lot of research going into these. Especially by a few, you know, recently it was All right, and it's over. Yeah. So here's our texture pack. All right, so you may have noticed I didn't quite get all the hearts there. I got only 16 of those uh, lines. <laughs> um, so again, as we mentioned earlier, uh, <laughs> each, um, each heart piece takes about 20 seconds to get from Skull Kid, so any heart piece I can get in under 20 seconds is gonna be faster. So some of the textures are gonna go away after this pause, not all of them, so you get some here. I should probably say real quick. Um, so, I have some good news or bad news, depending on your uh, your view, but uh, these textures stay until I save and reset, and I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> so. <laughs> so this is uh, gonna be the rest of the run. It's gonna be like look like this. And uh, another note to say is that every time this is done in a run, like an attempt, the textures look slightly different. So we don't actually know exactly what everything's going to look like yet. Um, yeah, there may there's be... probably going to be some really funny things coming up that yeah, even we're not expecting. Keep your eyes peeled. Yeah. <laughs> some things are really special. So one, one downside of this is it does lag a bit. Um, so th there's like... The thing about the lag is that not saving and resetting actually saves about 45 seconds, but then the lag loses some time too. Uh, I think it probably is technically faster to save or to get rid of the lag. But that's not that interesting. This is this is cool. So just another quick heart piece here. I just gotta go down Zora's River for a few heart pieces and the magic beans. Magic beans, one of the last uh, actual sea item slots I need to get. Probably farm bombs here. You can also use all those dots in the sky to kind of form a shape of a giant cube, which is what yeah. the skybox really is. Yeah, we, we live in a cube. Oh no, I just want to look up. Uh, okay, yeah, you can see the seams of the cube There's there. The corner. All right, I just gotta go grab some bombs over here, hopefully. Ooh, nice one. It was a nice one. That's a good. Okay. Wow. Easy. Oh, thank wow. you. So generous. And now, that's the end of the final child section. Time to go back to adult. And uh, finish the rest of the run as adult. Link has a little bit of acne. He's going through puberty. Yeah. yeah. And the uh, warp songs are extra sparkly today as well. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty neat. All right, so I'm going back, going forward in time again. That means Bottle Adventure is going to be activated by Adult since he had a bottle on B. So I act, I uh, equip, <coughs> uh, I equip Longshot on C right there, 
And that is going to put Ferrora's Wind on B yet again. And this really highlights the difference between Bottle Adventure and Reverse Bottle Adventure. We use Reverse Bottle Adventure to write things into our inventory, and we use Bottle Adventure to read from our inventory and put things on B. So it's kind of like opposite processes, hence the name. But Danny, why is one in Reverse and the other not? I don't know. Actually, I think Reverse Bottle Adventure got found first, which is it's interesting because Reverse Bottle Adventure is actually a prerequisite to getting Bottle Adventure. Yeah. But it wasn't understood that Reverse Bottle Adventure was a thing. So they found Bottle Adventure, then realized what Reverse Bottle Adventure was doing, had already committed to the name, and then inverted the name. Yeah. But some of the names for the tricks in this game are a bit weird, especially the older ones like that. And yeah, shout-outs to Kazooie for RBA and BA. All right, so I want to go to Gan's Castle now, but I don't have uh, the Shadow and Spirit Medallions. Or I don't have the Shadow Medallion. I do have the Spirit Medallion. But I need both of those and the Light Arrows to get to Ganon's Castle. Uh, I do have Light Arrows, but again, um, no Spirit Medallion. So I'm going to get to Gan's Castle another method. I'm going to climb up here and start a Super Slide here. Put some fireworks. Yeah, bombs look great with these textures. And the Super Slide is going to cross a big gap for me so I can get on this side of these hills. Going to step for Rosewind, uh, just so I can leave Ganon's castle quickly after I go in there. The stars are so pretty tonight. Yeah. <laughs> and now over here, I'm going to do another super slide on these hills. And this should take me directly to Ganon's castle. And now I can enter. So I'm actually going to need some bombs here, so uh, I gotta farm some bombs from these Beemos. Hopefully they're nice. Usually they aren't. And of course they won't be in a marathon, so let's see. Got about a half chance from each one. Uh, okay. Not bad. I need one more. Alright. Ooh. Nice. Alright, I got a little extra. So here in Ganon's Castle, I just have to get the Gold Gauntlets. They are the item you get in a chest in the Shadow Trial. So I'm just going to head over to Shadow Trial, go grab those. I can get across Shadow Trial pretty quickly with the long shot. I can long shot this torch. Pay, uh, pay particular attention to the hover boots in this room. Yeah. And then like, uh, hook shot the like like here. So I'm going to use the hover boots now. Hover boots are pretty neat with this glitch active. Okay, not that. Okay, okay. Does, sometimes it doesn't do anything. It might do it. Okay. Okay, yeah, there. And uh, it, it's it's like a different pattern every time. I'll actually show off a little bit. I'll run in circle a little bit. See if I can get some interesting patterns. Okay, there's, there's one. All right, yeah. <laughs> Pretty neat. So here's the gold gauntlet, and then I can warp directly out of here. Uh, one other thing I need to do in this area, though, is I need to go get double defense from the Great Fairy Fountain. Uh, so I'm going to set Furrow's Wind one more time and unequip Hover Boots. And that bomb I just dropped, I'm going to try to use to a Hess directly to the Fairy Fountain. So normally, the Fairy Fountain, you're uh, required to use Gold Gauntlets to pick up a block. I just got, got Gold Gauntlets, so I could do that, but I'm just going to clip in uh, anyway, since it's faster. <laughs> Bomb boost you right through the wall. And this should be the last uh, Great Fairy Fountain I have to go to. I guess another donation would be good here. Yeah. Unless something happens. OK, yeah, something oh, happens. Yeah, yeah. Uh oh. Forgot about this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, check out those hands. <laughs> it's got lovely pink flashing hands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, the hearts go back to semi-normal.
sometimes it's like all of her arms that are flashing. Yeah. That may appear with other NPCs too. Keep an eye out. <laughs> all right, so I said just a second ago I haven't beaten Shadow yet, and now I'm gonna actually go do that. So earlier on in the run, I just went to Shadow to grab Hover Boots. Uh, I could have actually beaten Shadow there earlier, but if I had beaten Shadow Temple earlier, then the lighter cutscene would have activated in Temple of Time when I had both the Shadow and Spirit Medallions. That's the longest cutscene in the game, and I really want to avoid it, which is why Shadow Temple is delayed to be beaten until all the way right now. Like we mentioned earlier, but we're doing another bomb push. We three bombs stacked on top of each other, which is right by the loading trigger. And you can go right through the front door. Yeah, pretty much the same time, same as I uh, used the first time. So in Shadow Temple, I'm actually going, going to go back to the exact same room I got the hover boots from, uh, but I'm going to do something a little bit different in that room. So the layout of Shadow Temple is um, really convenient uh, with this room <laughs> because uh, the Shadow Temple is like, the bottom part of Shadow Temple is one very long uh, pathway. And this part of Shadow Temple, like going back to the uh, the Hover Boots room, is also like a sort of uh, long type pathway also. And it happens to be that uh, this room is not far from the boss room. It's a little bit early. Wait, that worked? <laughs> I could have sworn that was not correct. Okay. So this room is not far from the boss room. Yeah, the super slide is oddly precise. Uh, most super slides are usually not that precise, but this one in particular is because of extremely picky pr uh, positioning. Two bombs I set behind me will actually push me out of bounds here. And the super slide will go all the way right to the boss room. Yeah, super slides aren't really that hard, but the problem with that one is that you need to press A to grab the bomb on a really particular frame, which stops Link's roll so that his position is in a perfect spot so the other two can actually push him out of bounds. So you can get a super slide on multiple frames there, but only one of them will actually get, the, get you the clip. Yeah, the problem is that the clipping out of bounds part, when the bombs actually push you through the wall, that part is very precise. And uh, because of that, that makes the super slide very precise. All right, so for the bongo fight, it uh, should be pretty quick. I just get ISG and quickly shoot the hands with the hook shot. Then I can shoot the eye real quick, knock him down quickly, and just kill him. Yeah, that, that's one of the laggier parts uh, with this the texture glitch. So after this similar situation as most of the other dungeons, uh, step in the blue warp with Furrow's Wind, warp away to skip the cutscene. Uh, again, this is, this is one of the dungeons that does not cause a long warp, so I'll just warp away normally. You can see like Navi's a square. <laughs> Sick burn. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't mean it like that, but sure. Not wrong. So once again, uh, warp away, skip the cutscene. Back here. So now I'm going to head out to Hyrule Field and go to Lon Lon Ranch. And it's snowing. Yeah. <laughs> so 
scared of my bomb count. Oh no, I'm just gonna back walk. Sorry, more time to look at this guy. Yeah. It's, it's moving. <laughs> the like, the like, uh, sparkly thing just moved. Okay, so I want to go to Longman Ranch because I need to get a Pona. Um, so I actually don't need a Pona for a whole lot. I actually only need it for the Gerudo Fortress archery minigame. Uh, otherwise, opponent is basically useless, but that's pretty important. Uh, as as for movement, like uh, people may think, you know, opponent is fast, you know, good to travel around the world. Um, Hazing is way faster. It's also worth noting that opponent isn't included in the 100% definition, so we don't actually need her to satisfy the requirements of this category. Yeah, and uh, you can get opponent. Oh yeah, by the way, the moon's cool. <laughs> You can get a opponent by just hovering over the fence. You don't even need to do the mini game, which is yep. super Nor useful. Yeah, normally, yeah, you like race and go twice to get a Pona, and then he like traps you in, and you have to jump over the fences to actually finally win a Pona. But if you just get get over the fence in some other way, you just get a Pona way faster. So now I just have to ride over to Gerudo Valley nice and uh, Gerudo Fortress. <laughs> he has shadows, great. Uh, you can probably read a donation number two here. Sure thing. We have a $500 donation. Woo! This is from Raj86, who says, only in Hyrule, shopkeeper, I have a magical fairy that will revive you from the dead and fill all your hearts. Link. Oh, cool. Shopkeeper. And it comes in a bottle. Link. Take my money! <laughs> What better time to donate than during the OOT 100% no source requirement run? It took me so long to beat this game as a kid, and watching ZFG completely break it, along with the great commentary from the couch, is a real joy. Thank you to all the runners, commentators, and staff for such an amazing event. Great to see so much positivity coming from the speedrun community. Good luck and go fast! 10th anniversary hype! So here, I can actually ride past the guards here. The guards' vision is actually much worse at night. Gray dust. Uh, the guards' vision is worse at night, so I can actually just ride past them and go park a Pona there. So now I have to uh, free all the guards, uh, beat all the Gerudos. So the Gerudo, uh, the Gerudo membership card was actually one item that, come on, uh, that would have been cool to get in the Deku Tree, uh, since it is kind of a lengthy process to um, to free all the guards. The problem is the Gerudo, the Gerudo membership card is actually not what makes you not get caught by the guards. It's actually freeing the carpenters. Um, so if you don't, if you get the Gerudo card but don't free the carpenters, basically nothing changes. So gotta free them anyway. Gotta get some rupees. I actually did not. Well, okay. I yeah, I did eat those rupees. And the guards decked out the cells with Christmas lights, which is pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Still got those lights up, huh? Wow, come on. That was like three weeks ago, two weeks ago. <laughs> I have 96 Deku Nuts. Okay, back to 30. At least the Guru does let them celebrate <laughs> holidays. So I can hookshot up to the jail cell here. And from here, if I hookshot the uh, corner of this board, I can clip through the wall. And from here, I have a good shot at the ch uh, chest over here with a heart piece. So this may lag a little bit as the moon comes into view. So Garuda Fortress is unfortunately one of the laggier places with this uh, whole texture glitch active. I uh, could probably squeeze in a donation here. Sure thing. We have a $50 donation from Revix212. He <laughs> said, I thought the glitch exhibition was after the run. How is this not the glitch exhibition? There's even more. Yeah, this, this run is uh, pretty much quite an exhibition itself. Actually, in fact, uh, there are some glitches in this run that were in previous glitch exhibitions and made their way into speedruns. Uh, one of them may be coming up soon. Hey, 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 hey. 
Wait. Okay, I thought I saw something. <laughs> There's gonna be the third of four here. You want another quick donation? Uh, yeah, sure. Sure. We have a $25 donation from Queen B. It says, ZFG is probably the speedrunner I have watched the most. Happy to donate during this, his run here at AGDQ. Keep up the good work. Also putting this to the Animorphs run because I read all those books as a kid and didn't even <laughs> know there was a game. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, oh, wow. This guy. <laughs> Got a bit of sunburn there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Looks pretty Radioactive bad. sunburn. <laughs> All right, so I got uh, a weird, uh, kind of weird thing to do here. I just want to leave and re-enter uh, this doorway right here. This is just so I can set Ferrora's Wind in this specific place. Uh, it has to be from that entrance specifically. No other entrance will work. And this will be useful for later on. We mentioned earlier that the, that the Gerudo card isn't, uh, doesn't really do anything. It does one thing. Uh, the Gerudo card is actually the ticket that will allow the girl who blocks the entrance to the training grounds to open the door for you. Um, if you free the carpenters so that she doesn't actually throw you in jail, and then you delete the Gerudo card, you can actually get a special text box that you wouldn't normally see in the game, where she tells you that you need the card in order to get in. Does this guy have the same thing? Yeah, I think so. I think so, yeah. Oh, no. wow. <laughs> These poor carpenters. <laughs> what do you think that feels like? <laughs> I have no idea. I, I, it can't be... Uh, it can't be good. It looks like a strobe light in his shirt. <laughs> <laughs> It's funny that that's happening here because you can you can make that happen on this girl's clothes with an explosive. Yeah. I I would show that off, but I'm kind of low on bombs. And I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So now that I've freed all the carpenters, I want to go to Gerudo Training Grounds, which is right below me. I'm gonna try to do a quick clip in. Nice. That just uh, skips having to pay to get in. <laughs> so Gudo Training Ground is supposed to be this long, uh, like, long trial place. You have to go around a bunch of rooms, collect a bunch of keys. Uh, eventually, you get enough keys to make your way to the final treasure, or you can do a weird shot and skip the whole thing, <laughs> since you can shoot under the ground and shoot straight to the end. Kind of a shame because Gerudo Training Grounds is one of the coolest areas in the game. Yeah. But you never really get to see much of it in a speedrun. So I use Furrow's Wind to warp out there quickly. And I want to set Furrow's Wind again. This will be the final use of Furrow's Wind. It's a really important one. And now I want to go do the uh, Gerudo Fortress archery minigame. So I'm going to make it daytime. So this place is a bit laggy. So I'm gonna talk to her to start the mini game. So uh, you can get two prizes here. You can get a heart piece and a quiver upgrade. Uh, the heart piece requires a thousand points, so I'm gonna try to get a thousand points here. One fifty-five. Uh, uh, I don't know if that's enough. So close. <laughs> Maybe I'll get a, a pity reward. All right, cool. I got it anyway. <laughs> All right, now I got to get the quiver upgrade. So this time I have to get fifteen hundred. A little bit harder.
Yeah, so the, the texture glitch makes uh, the score on this very unique. Oh wait, oh, did I, did I equip bombs? Uh, yeah, I do, okay. okay. So I need to pull out a bomb here to delay the quiver. I don't want to get the quiver immediately. I want to go over here and get the quiver this way. So I got the quiver here uh, while the Gerudo was off screen. And that's really important because that means the flag was not set to say that I got the quiver. This means that I can get the quiver again. It's pretty similar to the heart piece glitch you saw earlier. Yeah. What's the G? You already have that biggest quiver. Uh, oh, yeah, I do. I don't really need another quiver. Uh, well, you know what? I want to see what I get anyway. It might Maybe be she'll thing. give you an even bigger one. <laughs> oh, man. A hundred. Whoa. So, yeah. Um, I already have the biggest quiver, and something... Uh, going to get something interesting instead of another quiver upgrade after I finish this. One ninety-six. All right, no quiver upgrade here. Uh, gonna get this instead. <laughs> What's in here? <laughs> it's fire. <arrows. laughs> Yeah, so that's uh, what happens when you already have a quiver upgrade, or already have the biggest quiver upgrade, or any kind of unusual quiver upgrade for that. So I mentioned earlier, uh, some glitches have been in glitch exhibitions that made their way into speedruns. That trick was a, a glitch exhibition trick for a really long time, until 2018. It, it, I originally found that trick in 2009, and it took until 2018 to make its way into a speedrun. And uh, now it's actually useful in speedruns, which is really cool. I, I love it when like those kinds of just funny glitches um, that aren't really useful immediately, like eventually they get their time in the spotlight. It's quite uh, a lot of those actually. Yeah. So here's Fire Temple, the final dungeon of the game. So I'm gonna clip out of bounds here. Um, this room is invisible, but I kind of know where to go because I have some pre-planned movements, so I know exactly. I just do some exact movements and I know exactly where I'm going. Uh, I'm right in front of the boss door right now. I'm going to do a ledge clip. I'm right below the boss door now. Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm going to buffer ISG. All right, so now I want to uh, hover up a bit. And I should be able to hover directly into the boss room. Oh, seven. Oh, uh, this is going to be awkward. Uh, thing, I usually want to have a bomb here. Oh, well. Um... Okay, I think I'm just a bit. So what items do you have right now? Um, right now, I have almost all the items. The only things I'm missing right now are the last heart container for 20 hearts and the fire medallion. Uh, conveniently, I get a heart container from Avaldia, and I get the fire medallion from beating Fire Temple. So I might get them pretty soon. And then Ganon, right? Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to intentionally not attack Wawaja here. So uh, right now, there is... Uh, Wawaja has a second hitbox under the under the ground. Wait, this isn't going to kill, is it? No. No. Uh, all right, messed up Wawaja. Um, yeah, so Wawaja has two hitboxes, one that flies around and one that uh, pops out of the holes. And the hitbox for the flying one actually is under the last hole it flew into. So when I was using bomb chews on this hole, it was actually doing damage to Volvagia. And it got Volvagia down to very low health. 
So now, the lock is dead. And normally you'd be able to one cycle there, but ZFG just was a little bit low on explosives. And couldn't yeah. have enough. Yeah. All right, so I just need uh, one heart container and the fire medallion, and then I can go beat the game. So, uh, gonna get a heart container from here. Uh, time is coming up, by the way. So, gonna get my heart container. That's the last item I need. Going to step in the blue orb so I can get my fire medallion. But I'm also gonna warp away at the same time as I get my fire medallion. So, Gonna warp away, get my fire medallion, and I also beat the game, and that's time. I guess, I guess one just last thing to explain about uh, that. So that was obviously wrong warp to the credits. So Furrow's win set in one place, plus uh, warping there as the fire, fire medallion cutscene is starting, you know, wrong warps to the credits, very convenient. Also, uh, something interesting to note about the credits on the GameCube version. So the GameCube version is really unique because normally when you beat the game on the GameCube version, the credits are actually a movie file. It's unique to only the GameCube version and no other version, great face. Um, but when I wrong warp to the credits here, these are the real credits. These are the real in-game credits, not the movie file. Uh, so the, the real credits do actually still exist. Moon is still kind of messed up. Uh, and yeah, you can, you can still wrong warp to the credits, even though the normal credits is a movie file. So yeah, that's the run. Hope you guys enjoyed. So I guess we can move to the Blitz exhibition now. All right. Right. Um, I'm going to head up front for this one as well. Yep. My assistant will help me. OK, not my assistant, the person who is doing most of the work. <laughs> <laughs> so if that run wasn't enough of a Glitch exhibition for you, uh, we got more. Uh, just reset. Oh, wait. Uh, Wrong one. We're gonna switch to GameCube, uh, not, not uh, GameCube, N64. No. Yeah, so that run was done on the GameCube version, but the Glitch Exhibition will be done on N64. Uh, we got some important uh, glitches that will only work on the N64 version. We're on N64 and the screen is squished. Uh, all right, not too big. Uh, Fig, you want to start this out uh, talking about what we're playing on? Sure. So this is a uh, ROM hack of the game. We mentioned it a little bit earlier, but this is the practice ROM. Uh, this is a ROM hack created by Glank that has completely revolutionized how we practice and test things in this game. And uh, it's going to be very helpful in showing off all these glitches and allow us to do it efficiently. And yeah, so let's get right into it. So this, uh, what, what's really cool about this is it has save states, and this is incredibly good for showing off some glitches. So we can get right into it. So first thing I'm going to do is with Twinrova. So this save state here is Twinrova with very low HP. Twinrova is just about to die. One hit will kill her. And I'm going to uh, make sure that the beam is still shooting out of Link's shield when Twinrova dies. So as you see, the, it's lagging a lot, but uh, Twinrova gets hit as the... Uh, Twinrova dies as the beam is still hitting Twinrova. So that is attempting to stun Twinrova, but Twinrova can't be stunned because she's dead. But uh, when the game... when Twinrova dies, a 10,000 frame timer starts. And this is uh, just to say that Twinrova is invulnerable and nothing can happen. 
if you wait out those 10,000 frames, which happens to be about eight minutes, um, I'm skipping past those eight minutes with a save state, which is really nice. So if you actually wait, uh, wait it out, some interesting stuff happens. You may have just heard a sound. That was kind of weird. I don't think there's anything in the room. What, what's going on? Something fishy's happening. Eerie. Quiet. I don't like it. I hear a sound. Oh, no. So, Tornado was back from the dead. Um, oh, no, I didn't set the thing. No. Okay. Wait, I'll just do it right now. Uh... So this... Um... So we're going to use the hitbox viewer here. Yeah. So this is another really cool um, application of the, hit, of the practice ROM is a hitbox viewer. So as you can see, Twinroba is over there, but the beam is coming from over here. So the invisible Twinroba glitch, uh, Twinroba is always going to shoot from where she died, even though the body is moving in other directions, like she's right over there. Uh, you normally wouldn't see Twinroba. Uh, all right, got to wait for a fire one here. Uh, Okay. Um, so the, what's happening here is after the 10,000 frame timer, uh, that timer runs out and suddenly Twin Rover's allowed to be stunned again. And uh, the game state for the Twin Rover being stunned, uh, there's another, another kill here. Oh my Actually, god, you can. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you can repeat this over and over again. So again, I just hit Twin Rover, I killed Twin Rover as she's... Um, as she's dying, and that activates the glitch again. And you can repeat this over and over. So I'm gonna skip past the end of the cutscene. Also, she says something very interesting at the end of this cutscene. I'll come back to haunt you. <laughs> Wasn't exactly. lying. I'll come back in 10,000 yeah. frames to haunt you. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you also get multiple heart containers from this. So as you see, getting two heart containers here. And you can repeat this over and over, so you can get even more. So. Uh, here you can see this is way more than eight, or way more than two, it, it is eight. So I can keep getting. Now, a lot of people ask what happens when you get more than 20 hearts. Well, this happens. It continues to extend the second row of hearts. So this is 24 hearts. Uh, but you can get even more than this. Like this, uh, you can keep doing it over and over. Uh, so here's what happens if you get 128 hearts. Pretty amazing. Quite a lot. Um, now, there's something interesting with 128 hearts I want to show on the file select screen. So, this is what happens when you have this many hearts. Pretty neat. And uh, one last thing is it also spawns a bunch of blue warps. So, there's actually like multiple blue warps there, as you can see by the leg. So, I'm going to try Ocarina, item. <laughs> Ocarina Items on the edge of the blue warp here. And um, so, this will give me control. This is going to take uh, longer than normal. Um, because there's so many blue warps. Um, do you remember but, how Link was spinning earlier in Forest Temple? Yeah, yeah. So when when you go in a blue warp, it spins Link. And each uh, blue warp uh, adds a certain spin to Link. So with so many blue warps, uh, there's going to be a lot of spin involved. And I also got this floaty property. And so Link's going to start spinning. <laughs> oh. All right, on to the next part. So we're going to go to Fire Temple for the next one. So I want to open this chest, but I also want to die at the same time. This is going to cause some interesting stuff. So I'm going to set a bomb down right now and try to do a quick spin and then use Din's Fire. I'm going to use Frame Advance, another feature of this, to try to open the chest on frame two here. And this is going to kill me. So using Using the quick spin and then Din's Fire allows me to do some kind of action out of Din's Fire. Then I try to open the chest, then I die. And now uh, the chest opens, you know, I didn't quite open the chest. So I'm in this weird state where, like, I'm kind of supposed to be opening the chest. And this causes this weird glitch where Link kind of, if I try to do a slide hop or backflip, Link kind of does this weird jump. Uh, it's kind of like ground jump. Um, I, it's pretty much like infinite ground jump. Uh, it's not that interesting alone, though, but it has an interesting property if I do it when I die. Is I can just keep doing it. Uh, if you're familiar with the zombie hover glitch in Wind Waker, it made its way into OOT. Yeah, so since I'm dead, uh, Link is always walking in air, and I can just keep this up however long I want. Uh, unfortunately, if I 
Uh, one potential use we thought of for this was that we could load the room above it, but unfortunately when you load that room, it deactivates the glitch. Um, but there's another interesting thing we can do with this. So the boss door is right there. Uh, I'm not going to open it. I'm just going to hover over it. And uh, something interesting to note about this glitch is this is actually one of the most recent glitches. This was found, what, like early December? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this is, this is barely a month old. Uh, very recent. Pretty cool that we get to show off such a recent trick. Yeah, Holly and Freddy found that one. Yeah. And now for the third part. This is where I come in. Yep. Um, just going to open up a laptop up here up front. I uh, can't see it on camera, but part of this, what I'm doing now, is going to require a laptop. So you may be a bit confused. But just bear with me. Oh, yeah, can I have your USB? Yeah. Won't take long here. And we're actually going to switch. That was just on 1.2 version. We're going to switch to 1.0 um, to do the next part. Maybe a good time for a quick donation. Sure thing. We have uh, $50 from The Hell Sage, who says, watching ZFG play Ocarina is a trip. I have never been so excited to be so completely confused by what I'm witnessing. <laughs> Donation goes to ZFG's Choice, which, by the way, is now Animorphs. And we are almost halfway to what we need for that incentive to make the run happen. So keep up with those donations for Animorphs. <laughs> we all need to watch how bad that run is. So we're going to load the Japanese 1.0. And we're going to be doing some more SRM, which is the huge glitch that was found recently. Um, you saw us doing, or well, saw ZFG doing it in Deku Tree. Um, so I'm just going to load a save state um, outside Grand City. Uh, so I'm going to import a macro real quick, because another feature of the uh, practice room, a really nice feature, is that uh, we can play back some inputs. You might be familiar with a task. Um, you can play back inputs, and it's, so I'm just going to get the, this pre-recorded sequence of inputs where I just set up a few things. Um, I'm not playing, I'm not touching the controller. This is all stuff I recorded earlier just to get the setup. Um, and so earlier we did SRM with the boomerang, where you use a boomerang to pick something up, and then you unload it and load something else there. Uh, this time, we're going to use a pot, where we're going to get linked to pick up a pot, unload the pot, and make something else. Uh, load in memory where the pot was, so that now Link's hands that are holding the thing that is now not a pot, uh, not writing position data to a pot, but they're writing position data to something else. Um, so here we go, he's holding this pot, which actually then unloaded when I went to the next room. I'm gonna wander around a bit like we did earlier with going up to the compass room for seemingly no reason. I'm gonna go up to one of the rooms uh, at the top of Goron City. Again, just to shuffle the memory around in the way we need it to. We need to get certain things to load and then unload to make sure everything ends up in the right position in memory so that the thing we want to be uh, in memory where the pot used to be uh, is all correct and, and uh, as it should be. So we're going to enter this room, leave it again. Um, and need a specific angle because actually this time we're not writing position data, we're going to write angle data. Um, Sorry, just typing something in on my laptop. OK, so it's almost over. Ready for the next phase. What could this be doing? What could I possibly be writing to? I'm writing some data somewhere, and it's going to happen in this next room with Darunia. There you go, that's the setup. And now I'm going to press Enter on my laptop. Which is, gonna, which is actually connected to the controller ports of the N64. So my laptop's going to send something down the controller ports of my N64, and we'll see in a minute what that does. Oh, and the game's frozen. But don't worry. That's, I was expecting this. This is supposed to happen. Just sit tight for about 10, 15 seconds. So the magic's happening right now as we speak. So uh, during my run, I got a lot of you know, interesting items on the B button. So you may want to pay attention to the B button coming up. Some interesting stuff's going to happen there. And uh, just going to master his text. Uh, 
it's telling me all about, I don't know. I don't know what this text is, to be honest. <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, <laughs> this is, is, a, is a, there's something on my B button. That, this is Franker B. Um, and just a reminder, this is just a Nintendo 64 console, completely just, you know, regular Nintendo 64, nothing special, no emulators. Um, this is a modded version, but it is not required for this. This can be done on a regular N64. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Done, yeah. Um, so, shall I try it out? Uh, yeah, what happens when you press B? Let's try it. <laughs> oh, look. <laughs> Try it again. Do it again. All right. Oh. Oh. Don't crash the game. Huh? So don't crash the game. No, I, it yeah. takes more than that. <laughs> oh, uh, you gonna pause? Uh, sure. Why not? Hey, what's oh, that? Oh look. I got a dog on my C. You got you got zero though. It's all right. <laughs> Still use them. Um, so we should maybe explain a little bit what happened here. Um, what you just saw was, the, was an example of the first time we have what people call ACE, or arbitrary code execution on Ocarina of Time. Um, specifically, this is a payload that was written by Glank, who also made this uh, ROM. And it's a very complicated way to, we use the SRM glitch to redirect uh, where the game is looking at and executing code. So what I actually wrote to when I did this glitch was, do you want to spawn some dogs while I'm talking? Uh, I don't know how to use N64. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> wait, wait, I, can, I guess I can switch the... Switch no, no, the no, 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 don't, don't Yeah, do okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so what we did in, in Deku was write some data to the chest to make the va um, variable that changes the chest contents to be something different. What I did here is I wrote some data to some code in Darunia's code, you know, the code that runs when you speak to him with something in your hand. And it's a very complicated setup, and I can't explain all of it now, yeah. but the idea is we managed to get the code that normally runs when you talk to Doronia to do something else instead, and we get it to jump to all this data that we set up earlier, which is actually interpreted as code by the game. And eventually, we, through all of that, we managed to get it to uh, go into a sort of mode where it starts reading controller inputs. So that's where it was frozen for a a while there. My, my laptop was sending a bunch of, you know, regular analog stick and button press inputs into the N64, and our little setup there was able to convert that into code, which uh, part of that was to draw the Frank uh, uh, Z uh, icon on B, um, and... Uh, you want to show what, what the code actually was? Sure. So, um, I guess I'll import that one. Um, so, the way, I mean, it requires a few things. One of them is the uh, file name, which we give a specific name, and it's interpreted as code, and it jumps, that code jumps somewhere else, and jumps somewhere else, and eventually it gets to the Scarecrow song, which we play in a very specific way, um, which I'm going to demo to you at the moment, uh, just right now, uh, P1. Um, so I'm, it's, it's playing a song through the uh, N64 controller one, and you can see at the bottom there's like a little input display. It says 0, 9, that's analog stick position. That's just switched to 13. Um, and this is essentially just like a 15-minute song that we're playing to this guy. <laughs> and it's, it's, it doesn't sound nice, and it's... Uh, I mean, he's jamming, but it doesn't yeah. sound nice, and it's, it doesn't do anything else in-game, but this data, this so, it's so rich, you can press buttons, you can pitch bend the note, and he remembers all of it. So it, that data that we set up in memory, we can then jump to and execute it as code and instructions. And that code and instructions is the thing that allows us to then start pulling uh, controller inputs and write that really efficiently and get Frank Z. Uh, so I'm not going to show all of this because, this, I, like I said, it's 15 yeah, minutes. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> um, we don't need it. We don't have time for that. So. Uh, one more thing I'm going to show, just because I can. Um, and uh, I guess we'll end on this note, um, although I might have a few more shout-outs afterwards, but for the glitch wait, exhibition... Wait, no, no, do the thing, do the thing. Okay, fine. All right, so I actually think I already dropped some down here earlier. Oh, we actually found a new glitch literally about an hour ago. Yeah. With this. 
Oh, oh yeah, I never kid. Okay. But, uh, well, yeah, there's, there's, there's a few dogs down under there. there. Um, <laughs> just chilling. I put those down there earlier. Um, they can breathe, don't worry. Yeah, I'll end the glitch, glitch exhibition on this. I uh, might have a few shout outs afterwards, but as for the glitch exhibition, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, sure thing. All so right. obviously this is huge. Uh, N64 Ace um, has never really been done on Ocarina of Time before. So huge shout outs to Glank for making this all possible. Um, the task that I'm using was made by my best friend, Roggy, who's just like amazing at this stuff. Um, just like, huge shout outs to like Fig and Natalia and Thara and Mr. Cheese and a bunch of other people. Um, and just like thanks to everyone in the OT community. Everyone wave, come on. I mean, you guys are great. Um, and I'll maybe let you. Yeah. All right, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for watching, guys. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, this was pretty cool. And yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. That was a fantastic run. Thank you again to ZFG and all of the wonderful commentators, plus that glitch exhibition. That was amazing. We will be right back. We are going to play a quick ad and then get ready for a wonderful interview. All right, welcome back, everyone. We are going to throw it over to a nice interview with the with uh, J Hops and Mike. Hey, thanks for coming through Fruit Cup, and we are going to have a fun little interview here because I have not only just Mike Oyama, but I also have Breakdown here with us because we are going to be doing a little bit of reflection in this interview. That's right. As you all know, we've been talking about it all week. This is the 10th anniversary of Games Done Quick, and it all started with classic Games Done Quick. And these two are the two remaining staff members, people who have been here the whole time, that were actually at Classic Games Done Quick. And of course, we all know, Mike, you kind of kicked everything off and yep. started it all. So, But Breakdown has been integral the entire time as well. So I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about where GDQ has, you know, gone since then, and maybe share a few memories or something from CGDQ as well. Uh, yeah, sure. So to put in perspective, uh, when CGDQ happened, uh, there was no Twitch. <laughs> there was Ustream and Justin TV, and you'd be like, oh, you would pick Justin TV because the predecessor was the Twitch. But no, Justin TV, uh, if you had more than a thousand viewers on your stream, it would start booting people uh, overseas. <laughs> because they either didn't have servers overseas or they were really bad. <laughs> <laughs> the kind of and, challenges that are now, like, seem ridiculous. Yeah, you know? exactly. 
<laughs> and, and we were like, well, we probably won't reach 1,000 viewers, but in case if we do, we, we, you know, we don't want to you know, boot all of our European viewers, <laughs> you know, <laughs> international viewers uh, off the stream. And uh, I remember we did actually get up to 1,500 viewers at one point in CGDQ. And then that was when Ustream like started petering out and like it like just booted half of our viewers from, <laughs> from the event. And we're not sure why uh, that happened. And like what people tried to do is that they tried to set up uh, restreams like on other services like live stream. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is that if you didn't have a verified account on live stream, you could only have 55 concurrent viewers at once. <laughs> Shout out to the beach hat. And, uh, <laughs> and Poexel uh, told me that when he was, you know, CGQ did drop out for him at that point, and he was watching uh, one of those live streams, you know, one of the exclusive 55 in that <laughs> stream. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so I do want to uh, ask, like, Mike, you obviously kicked everything off, and I believe it was mostly with forum posts, right? And yes. Talking uh, to people on SDA. Yeah, yeah. So um, back then, the main uh, speedrunning source and community was Speed Demos Archive. Uh, Speedruns Live was in its infancy. I think they only had three races in 2009. Um, Speedrun.com didn't exist. So Speed Demos Archive was really, like, the main place to go back in 2009. And I know that people are like, oh, it's so outdated. And yes, that's true, but like, it's really like the foundations where a lot of uh, speedrunning came from. And, and then Breakdown, did you find out about CGDQ? Like, did, were you friends with Mike at the time? Did you already know? Or did you find out like, from this forum post? How did you get involved? Well, I was friends with Mike at the time. Yeah. Uh, we had IRC channel, the SDA IRC yep. channel. Um, talked about it there. Um, and yeah, basically, there was forum posts talking about a marathon, like a nebulous marathon. And everyone's like, oh, I could play this, and I could play that, yes. and I could play this, and that, and the other that. thing. And then got more focused, and it's like, we're going to do this at this time. Yes. We're going to have these kind of boundaries, who can actually come, and it got more focus yeah. from there. So I, I want to know, because I think this happens a lot of the times when planning just like group activities with friends, but also especially live events. Were there any moments in the planning, as I think I'm still going through the stream. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, we lost the, the feed over here for a second. Um, were there any moments where you felt things weren't going to happen? Like there were too many issues suddenly showing up or planning oh, wow. people was too hard. Um, oh, no, it's not going to happen. It's, it's all going to fall apart. So um, I didn't feel that way until... So the classic game's done quick. It's kind of infamously known for being in my mom's basement. Mm. But it was actually supposed to happen at MAGFest, specifically MAGFest 8. And I remember going to the hotel at New Year's Eve, which was the first day of MAGFest, and... We were uh, registering for the event, and what ends up... <laughs> Sorry, we're having some technical difficulties, so difficulties over here. I think we might need to go to the uh, break screen for a moment. Yeah, yeah. So, uh... Hello, Awesome Games and Quake. I am Edel Bean, and I will be your host for 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 a while. <laughs> We're just about getting. Oh, thank you. <laughs> We're just about getting uh, ready for the cadence of Hyrule. Um, but uh, just a big reminder: um, if you want to start awful games done quick the wrong way, you need to donate to get that Animorph Games in, okay? Right now we're at 31,391, and we need 60,000. I know we can do it. Let's do it, just, just so that we can tease keys. Tease keys, that's, that's the key word here, okay? I'm just gonna read a couple of donations really quickly. We got a $25 donation from Anonymous that says, best way to start the year. Thanks to all the GDQ runners and staff, take my rupees. 
$21 from Lauren171 that says, a dollar for every heart piece. Yay for GDQ. Random Hughes donates $500, saying, we need to see the glory. That is the Animorphs run. Let's make it happen, chat. Warm Pop Tart donates $25, says, Hey, ZFG, love the run, love the game. Shout out to my boy Danny on the couch. Keep it up and let's stop cancer before it starts. Deltora QN donates $200 that says, OOT was my first Zelda game and one of my favorite to watch run. I'm so glad I got to catch it live and donate to the Prevent Cancer Foundation. My grandmother passed away from pan uh, pancreatic cancer two years ago. So I am happy to donate to this charity. We had a $50 donation from No Name that says, hello, I've been watching GDQ events for years now and haven't been able to donate until now. My grandfather turned 75 this year and asked all of his grandkids, myself included, to donate to charities of our choice to celebrate. I'm glad I got to donate during one of my favorite games, Ocarina of Time, which is one of the first games I've ever played. Thanks for everyone, you, for all you do. I'm loving watching every second. And it seems like we're gonna go back to an interview. That's right, we're back. You thought you got rid of us with technical <laughs> difficulties, but you didn't. And that's really the story of what we're talking about here. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> so nothing apparently has changed in the last 10 years. We still uh, have some technical difficulties that uh, slow things down sometimes. <laughs> but you were telling us about the hardships. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah, so at moments where you thought maybe everything was going to fall apart and the event wouldn't happen. Yeah, so I thought everything was going okay until we arrived at MAGFest at New Year's Eve and we we're all registering. And, you know, I told... Uh, the MAGFest, you know, check-in or registration staff, you know, I'm from Speed Demos Archive. Um, we bought these uh, Wi-Fi modems or WiMAX modems. And, um, you know, they, you said that as long as we purchased one, you know, we could use them for the event and use them to stream our event. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, yeah, about those modems, um, that company was bought out and they don't work anymore. And this was less than 24 hours uh, before our event was supposed to start. Um, we were wow. given the Wi-Fi code, which was gold. Won't work here at this hotel, just, just FYI. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after you know, three hours of trying to search for IT and tech, um, I managed to flag down like maybe two people. And one of them I talked to over the phone. And he said, well, and the best advice uh, he could give you was, well, do you know that the Wi-Fi code is gold? I'm like, yes, 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 thank you very much, I do. And I remember I had the most miserable New Year's Eve. It was by far the worst one I ever had because that was when we thought the event would not uh, work out. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, um, we did try a test stream at my mom's house uh, the next day, and it worked. Like, there was a functioning stream. Now, to put this in perspective, this was Flash Media Live Encoder where you had a video input, an audio input, you set the bit rate, and you were good to go. <laughs> <laughs> so there was, things were a little bit simpler. We can even see from our, our lovely uh, art <laughs> yeah, yeah. LK here. Things are a little bit simpler on, on like the layout and there. And uh, obviously on the tech end, I'm sure everything was a scramble uh, trying to get it all moved. Uh, yes. Um, so we did get the stream up at MAGFest, like, you know, your trick question during yeah. the pre-show. Yeah. Um, however, it was a complete slideshow. It was Mega Man 1 and the Guts Man's platforms were like, uh, d two, <laughs> yeah. 60 frames two. of stage. Basically. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it, it was virtual high light, basically. Right, yeah. You know, vir virtual high light running normally. <laughs> exactly. And uh, what we found out uh, from the CEO of MAGFest at the time and their lawyer was that the hotel was locked into a contract with their cable provider, and it was really bad DSL that had maybe half a megabit of upload. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and now, nowadays, like that, we need a little bit more than that. Just, just, just a, a tiny bit. bit. <laughs> I mean, if you want, you know, I guess 
unless you want to go back to days DGQ and want a maybe 144 <laughs> piece stream. But uh, yeah, so um, it was already past where the event was supposed to start. It was like six or six thirty, which was, and we're supposed to start at six. And uh, it was the the atmosphere was just very tense and stressed out and I remember being a mess and I remember we eventually came to the conclusion that it would not work mm -hmm. at MAGFest and we had to go to my mother's basement to <laughs> do this event and so all the equipment we brought to MAGFest we had to drive over to my mom's basement and all the people who were planning to stay at MAGFest, which was, you know, a fair assumption, had to be driven over to my mom's basement because <laughs> why would they have a car if they, you know, just need to you right. know, go down a few floors to the, you know, MAGFest show floor to have the event. Um, so did you have, like, yeah. morning fairies going back and forth or was everybody just staying at the house at that point? Uh, it was a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, I can tell you that there were definitely people like doing some food and drink runs and the like. And I remember I got a 24 pack of Mountain Dew for people. And there were like 20 people roughly at that event. <laughs> and uh, I get the 24 pack, I put it in the house and it's gone less than an hour. Right. And I don't <laughs> even drink Mountain Dew. So like <laughs> Well, I did want to ask some more um, kind of specific questions about both CGDQ and, of course, how yeah. Games and Quick has grown over time since then. Because obviously a little bit different now. We've got a very large ballroom here. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, little, right. Just a just, little bit. We were, we were able bit. to reproduce the set from CGDQ in yeah, yeah. one small section. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I did want to, of course, shout out a social media question from at Sega Junkie because that is Mike89, yes. one of the... Uh, original members yes. of CGDQ. And, and for anyone who saw that highlight reel, you could see the clips of him uh, sleeping on the couch. So. Mm -hmm. And what he asked was, uh, what kind of skills have you kind of developed over time that's helped uh, GDQ grow? What have you had to learn yeah. um, specifically through the growth of the, uh, of the, the channel and the growth of uh, the event? Honestly, a lot. Yes. Um, you know, including, so you know, uh, delega uh, sorry, delegation, organization skills, and like, but really, the biggest thing you have to learn is that you, you, you know, obviously, you, 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 know, you want to try not to make mistakes, but the thing is, inevitably, a mistake is going to happen, and instead of being frustrated by it, you have to learn from it, because you will make mistakes. I probably made every mistake under the sun. When we started CGDQ, we didn't even have the camera focused on the runners, because we thought they wouldn't be talking that much, so we should just focus on the people like commentating or talking you know, during <laughs> the run. You know, kind of like, a bit like the host. Right. And you know, like, we, the, that Logitech webcam you saw at the very beginning of the pre-show, that also ended up being our microphone. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't, you know, realize that for two or three hours. But, you know, you, you shouldn't beat yourself up over the mistakes. You just need to learn from them mm -hmm. and move on. Right. And that's how we were able to bring you the second half of this interview after <laughs> some Always improving. Yeah. Always improving. Yeah. I want to direct the next question at Breakdown specifically um, from at Bondorito. They asked, how, do you, how did you all determine what was classified as a classic game back then? Because now we take games from all eras. Right. Yeah. Back well, then it was classic. Uh, the first event, we wanted it to have a focus. Mm. Um, so we decided to just go with older games. So we settled mostly 8 and 16-bit games. Uh, we had, what, one PlayStation game and one GBA game, yep. I think. Yeah, so, it was a Zero Mission and uh, Symphony of the Night. Yeah, now, at the time we felt it was important to just sort of categorize the event. So we kept it within that time frame. So that was kind of the base definition we used there. Mm -hmm. Just anything that really kind of you know, just felt classic, basically, right? Yeah, well, yeah exactly. And we had a lot of just classic game runners at the event, so right. it yeah. worked out. Makes sense. I know back then there was a lot of people, sometimes you'd have one or two people running like multiple games was, constantly. Uh, <laughs> Very common yes. for basically every game, like the game communities were much smaller at that point. Yeah, it was yeah. like, like somebody was like, you know, like the Zelda 1 guy and somebody was yeah. the F Zero guy. And your yeah. community was big if it had more than one person. <laughs> Which, for some games, still true now. But true. <laughs> one, one last thing. I wish we had more time to talk about CGDQ, but I did want to show off something that you have shown off on stream before. Classic. But that uh, nice. this is actually the original tracker. Uh, and it's 
you'll notice I'm holding a framed sheet of paper. <laughs> <laughs> but this was the tracker. Like, th this was the way that you kept track of donations. And uh, yeah. What, what, like, was this just a matter of, oh, nobody really thought about uh, doing a tracker? Or was this, nobody thought there would be any kind of large number of donations, so we'll just keep tracking on pen and paper, and how quickly did you move off of pen and paper? Uh, so, well, we had, like, a spreadsheet to track donations, and we had this widget called Chip-In, which uh, we also killed in later GDQ, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the paper, so everything on that tracker is for the Final Fantasy VI names. And it's funny, because when we were on the forum, we saw the Speed Gamers, who were like a uh, who are still around, mm -hmm. and they're a, a charity f uh, fundraising group. They're not speedrunners, they're more casual. And, um, you know, we heard that someone donated $1,300 to name all the characters in Final Fantasy VII Sephiroth. <laughs> and, we're, and, and we were like, oh, yeah, that, that's a pretty good idea. We were like, that's a great idea. We should do that. <laughs> we're like, yeah, we can do that, whatever. And then we realized, oh, like when the Final Fantasy VI one was starting, oh, someone actually has to keep track of these <laughs> names. So SMK, who also started our tracker, started writing down these names. And I remember sometime during the marathon, he's like, I'm going to create a solution that gets us <laughs> off of pen and paper for the event. It was good to his word. <laughs> well, it was good to his word. Well, Mike, breakdown again. I wish we had more time to talk and yeah. just get into tons of old memories and also just lots of comments about I how things I could grow, talk but. for hours about Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you could. And if you ever missed it, there is, like, there's a panel about yeah. CDQ as well a couple um, of months ago. So what, check that I, There's out. also a VOD on the classic games done quick uh, redone or the 10th anniversary mm -hmm. um, of Gunstar Heroes, and I also talk about it a bit uh, during that, yeah. that run. So if you'd like more information about the original event, classic games done quick, and also just kind of how Games Done Quick has grown in general. This is just a small a small slice. Check out the YouTube VODs. You should find everything you need there. And with that, I think we are just about ready to see a, an excellent race of Cadence of Hyrule between Spooty Biscuit and Royal Goof. So I'm going to throw it right back up to Edobean. See you all. All right. And actually, I think it is time for some Cadence of Hyrule. All right. Are you guys ready? 